feet. Ciao, signore e signori. <laughs> e benvenuti da Pedale Show! <laughs> Uh, yeah. Dan's been away. Was that actual Italian? Yeah. Not bad. You like that? You gonna welcome our guest? Who, him? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're joined by our very good friend Thorpey. He's popped in for the day. Yes. Thanks for popping over, mate. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No, of course. It's lovely to see you. In the area? Never been here? No. Is it... Is is it, it, what are your impressions? Decadent. Yeah. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> it's a good word, though. Oh, um, welcome, good. everyone. Uh, VCQ, viewers, comments and questions. We do this most Mondays. You haven't seen us for a few weeks because we've been on holiday. See. So vacation. Um, pri prizes go to anyone who can guess where Dan went on his uh, holly bobs. Oh, man. I'm just going to log in to make sure that we are actually on the air. It'd be hilarious if we weren't. Yeah, well, yeah. that would that would not be a first. <laughs> yes, so I've been to Rome with the family for a week, and we just had the best time. So um, massive thank you to, um, yeah, everyone we met out there, and who was fascinated by what we did. Who me just, and you? Yeah. Oh, I see. You had to explain it to people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was great. Did yeah. you do as the Romans do? You know, when in Rome? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Chariots. <laughs> um, that was great. Dan's probably already said this, but um, Adrian Thorpe, MBE, uh, from Thorpey Pedals. If you don't know Thorpey Pedals, go and check them out now, but I rather suspect most of you do know Thorpey Pedals. M MBE, so is that Sir? No, no, no that's Knighthood. <laughs> that's Knighthood. Yeah. All right. Okay. It's... It yeah, it's the f so it's it's an honour from the Queen, yeah. Okay. Sir will do. Nah, yeah, I thought it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, she's to embarrass you with that, mate. I am very... <laughs> Thank you. It Got the colour of your carpet now. It is a great honour, though, right? Yeah. S seriously. Yeah, did massive. she high-five you on that? She did She did give me my medal. It was the Queen who... who... Dude, that's amazing. Yeah, I've, I, you know, I... I I'm very seldom speechless. Right. And, and at that point, I was just sort of rabbit in headlights. I was so nervous. It, it was hard to... Because my family are right there as well. It was, oh, man. How it was all man. crazy. That's, That's amazing. amazing. Well, and what year was that? 2013 is when I got... Oh, well, it's, was, I hadn't realised it was that long ago. Yeah, so... Um, Blimey. Yeah. Post-Olympics. Um, we, we find ourselves in the slightly unusual position of being full of super chats so i'm going to turn them off now wow um bv we want to say thanks to bv ninja for moderating uh that crazy place out there mm. full of all you lovely people bv thank you yes thanks bv um for being there as always we massively appreciate it so uh if you have super chatted already we will answer you if you have not uh it's too late baby now it's too late nice yeah very good yeah um I understand the implications of this action. Watch what happens, Dan. When I turn it off, yep. it'll stay on. Ah, oh, sometimes it just flicks back on again. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's how they get you, you see. <laughs> Very good. What have you been up to then, Thorpey? What's what's interesting in uh, Ooh, Thorpey Land's world? So, summer, you should be quiet, but we've just been prepping for certain things that are released later on. and Oh, new products. Yeah, new products oh. and, you know, a little bit of a small product. And we're doing some charity stuff at the moment, uh, a bit of a plug for that. Oh, lovely. So if people want to support that, please go to the website. Um, other than that, just sort of, we, we tend to work about a year to two years in advance. So the right. things that are coming out in about two years' time, we've started now. Um, and we think we're done, but two years down the line, it will be uh, we'll be done then. <laughs> you know how these things go. <laughs> so, an interesting uh, discussion that we may get into a bit, bit more full on later is, as a manufacturer, things that are affecting you at the moment. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, there's a for people who don't know, there's a worldwide component shortage, um, and what I found out recently 
is that uh, component manufacturers, especially processor manufacturers, are making more processors now than they ever have in the history of manufacturing. Wow. You still can't get them. Right, so I, I heard a rumor, right. and I'm, I, you know, it's a rumor, so I can't, I can't cite you the can't, source. You can't confirm or deny. I cannot confirm or deny it. No, <laughs> um, that a lot of the problems still was stored up with uh, the automotive manufacturers mm. at the, when the pandemic happened, turned off all of their demand of chips. Yeah. But there was only so many chip houses, and so they essentially lost their slot. Yes. And right. They, and then what ended up happening was that they uh, realized that people were still buying cars. Yeah. And right, can we have all our, our chips? No, no, you can't. Back to the queue. You know, it's a matter of principle. So what they've been doing is buying up everything, mm. um, whether they need it or not. Like Lou Roll in the pandemic. It, it's like a car, yeah, big manufacturer version of Lou Roll. Yeah. Sorry, um, Catherine's saying I need to move left a bit because we look very squashed up. Well, that's okay, except now we have an audio problem. Oh, okay, sorry. No, it's fine. Right. You stay where you are, mate. Okay. Yeah. I'll speak over here. It's an interesting uh, fact about shotgun mics. They're okay when there's two of them. Yeah. But when there's three, phase, phasey, phasey, phase, phase, unless you've got someone. I have a question for anyone who works in TV, right? Uh, when you watch the news and, um, you know, she's there saying how bad everything is, and then it flicks to the person she sat next to, do they duck her mic and put the other person's mic up? Because... If we're doing that, we have to do that. Yeah. Because you get such amazing crosstalk, especially from a lapel, which is an omni, right? It's not even a directional mic. But if you see people on like morning TV and they're talking over each other all the time. Yeah, how does that work? I don't know. Yeah, I'm interested. Uh, people are saying like, Gene Johan says, Dan, move over a bit to your right. And then someone says, uh, uh, Chris Quinn says, it's a normal gap. Dan and Nick just miss, miss, each, miss each other a lot. <laughs> No, it's because we have we have uh, one between two microphones, you see, and our guest has a microphone all to himself. I'm very honoured. Because that's you. how it should work. Indeed. Right. Okay, let's get into it. Um, welcome, everyone, and thanks for being here today. Um, Benvenuti. Uh, Jeremy Summers wants to know, is Thorpey going to bring you one of his boneyard fuzzes? It's fantastic. I think I sent you one. Yeah, we have got one. one. We're just a bit late getting to it. And yes, it is fantastic. Um... Frankie Holt is on. Uh, greetings and salutations from Muscle Shoals, Alabama, hit recording capital of the world, as you always say, Frankie. Sweet home. Super proud of it, you are too. Nice one. Uh, have, you, have you been to Alabama? No. Have you been to Alabama? I have not, sadly. Okay. No. There we go. Uh, Baby John is on. Uh, Matt Scott is on. Scott Gaylor is on. Hello, Scott. Hey, Scott. G Barge, nice to hear from you. Back in Marin County, I see there. You know, they invented mountain biking there. How do you invent mountain biking? You're um, saying people have never been up a mountain on a bike before. No, no, no. They put fat tyres on it. That's why you get the fat tyre beer in San Francisco. And uh, went down the hill. You say Marin? Yeah. I was in the Marin mountain bike. That makes yeah. a lot of sense now. Yeah, Marin, <laughs> yeah. Marin, I think they say Marin, but anyway. Um, Lee Tintle says, Greetings and welcome back from Vermont, USA. Vermont? Vermont. My wife lived there for a bit. There you go. That's interesting, isn't it? Your wife has just texted me. Are you, do you find this scintillating, Thorpey? I'd, I'd like to go to Vermont. <laughs> Skiing. It'd be amazing. Lots of people are asking, have we hit record on the podcast? Yes, we have. Thank you kindly. For Thank you very much. much. <laughs> we, our, our beautiful people always remind us now. That's because good. Because we get to the end of it and Mick would go, oh, word. Damnation. Da yes. <laughs> Heavens to Burgatroyd, oh, I haven't. <laughs> Even BV, have you set the podcast to record? <laughs> See, this is... any That's team. Team any, effort. Any meaningful really beautiful... community is held up by its members, isn't yeah. it? That's just the fact of the matter. Uh, have we got any housekeeping to do, Dan? Um, we do. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's here. Uh, sorry, we will get to some questions in just a moment. Um, Dan's Solar Myth Pedal, the patron giveaway for this... Uh, month um has bizarrely enough gone to daniel from australia <laughs> legend uh, he's from seahampton in new south wales australia so uh from dan not in australia to dan in australia congratulations um, man. that's great you're lovely congratulations the next giveaway will be announced in early september so if you are a tps patron you will get an email if you are not a tps patron you will not and it's going to be the boss md 500 um multi modulation pedal 
thanks to Boss for allowing us to uh, give that away. Nice. So there you go. If you want that, become a TPS patron. Boom. Um, we do have a couple of new T-shirts coming out. We'll do th th this one. That'll be uh, in the stores tomorrow. I'll this is give you a visual clue as to the inspiration to this T-shirt. Love it. Check this out. It really should have had Mick wearing this, but there's yeah. Anyway, we're gonna sunburst. Sunburst TPS shirt. Some TV shows pay thousands for graphics that would have done that. And the tune. Yeah. Yeah. Is that Not pre? Needed. We had to license the tune. Oh right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Pre CBS T-shirt. Yeah. So sunburst, uh, sunburst that pedal show. T-shirts will be on sale soon. Um, Royal Mail. I've advised us there will be strike action later this week and early in September. So apologise if you buy anything by Royal Mail, it may be delayed. Uh, no shipping. Oh God, this is so boring. <laughs> Hang on, you you read that out. Yeah. I'll do some I'll do some chase music. Okay, I have to sing it out. There will be no shipping from Royal Mail uh, this Thursday, the 25th of August to the 31st of August, so a week, 25th. However, the good news is we do ship via UPS and also uh, FedEx, so um, just choose one of those instead. Uh, and again, from the 7th to the 9th of September, there will be information at that pedal show store. If you're going home this weekend, please move your brother's clothes to the lower peg and remember to write the letter home to your mother. And thank you. Um, <laughs> it's better. Uh, we've been it. working on that. As you know, Thorpe is well aware, we've been working on that all day. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the housekeeping out of the way. Let us get to some questions. Let us get to some questions. And thank you to everyone who has super shut. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Lots of coffee. <laughs> Oh dear. It is good to be. Did you get a, Did you get a holiday this year? Oh, I took my holiday in December. Okay. Um, last year. Yeah. Because that way I avoided everyone else. Yeah. Uh, and we where did you go? Went to Mauritius. Oh, okay, that'll work. In the middle of nowhere, which was great. Lovely. And uh, it it was it was more depressing coming home because obviously the weather's yeah that much disparate. Yeah. But it was lovely. Well, yeah. we went we went in the. Like first or second week of August, can't, can't remember. But we got back and it was hotter in the UK than it was in Rome. Yeah, it was mad. It was absolutely outrageous. It was banging. Yeah. And Dan went to Rome. Did you have a nice time, Dan? Oh, man, we had the, we had the best time. It was so that's cool. So brilliant. Yeah, we absolutely loved it. Went down to so we stayed in Rome for the week, but we did some day trips. I so went to Pompeii um, for the day. Walked up Mount Vesuvius. It was amazing. Um, and just, you know, we did all the stuff to the Colosseum and that, but I think we're at, uh, uh, Trastevere or Trastevere, <laughs> like every night, which is the coolest little area in Rome where they have all these little trattorias and these amazing little outdoor places and ate like it was an Olympic sport and Dan was going for gold. Good work. Oh uh, man, it was just amazing. We had, we had the best time. It was really lovely. Yeah, nice. and it's the first time away since before COVID. Yeah, that's a big deal, isn't it? And it, it was just to feel like you could travel again. Like normal. Was, was amazing. You know, it really was amazing. Uh, Catherine and I do not have children, therefore we can stay in the UK. We're not forced to go away when everyone else has to go away. So we can go when it's cheap. So <laughs> that's why you're always smiling. We'll, <laughs> we'll be going later in the year. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Yeah. We, got, we got reamed on the prices. It's yeah. like just phenomenal. Um, however, worth every penny, um, you know, Italy is collectively as a family, it's our favorite place in the world. So the last time we went out there, we did, we flew into Venice and did all the Northern part. This time we did Rome. Next time we're going to go down to Amalfi and do all oh, that wow, stuff. Oh, wow. Nice. Just, we love everything about Italy, the food, the people, the scenery. It's just such a beautiful place. They, the Italians, food. The, the food. But they've got so many things sorted. They've, I think there's a priority list. I think the Italians have their priorities sort of in a nice place. Mm. Economy's yeah. in the cars, isn't it? Yeah, but whose isn't? Yeah. Ours isn't. I just had to rain on that cloud. On that. It all sounded too happy. And you there, get to so go yeah. back and see that man in Pompeii that I mentioned we earlier. Did. Oh my. <laughs> have you seen that? 
Uh, oh, man, so I'll tell you that a bit later. Okay. It's unbelievable. Did Gilmore leave any stuff there? Did you find any... Echo Wreck parts everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it was... Because uh, the Echo Wreck was pre-eruption. So it was still bits of Echo Wreck. 77. Was that eruption? <laughs> Ooh. It might have been 78, which, you know, completely ruins the gag. Anyway, Ran's there. Hello, Ran. It's nice to hear from you. He says, welcome back, D&M and B and K, and we should say and T. Um, hope you had a fantastic summer break. Uh, love the YouTube shorts format you did with Matt at Monty's. <laughs> Concise to the point, not one second wasted. Uh, I, I watched every second. Um, yeah, if you haven't watched it, 61 Strat got a refret and the video was 2 hours and 12 minutes long. And what a spectacular video it was as well, mate. You did such a wonderful job. Well, Matt did Loved the wonderful it. job. I just stood there and went, my goodness me. <laughs> yeah, but so good. It's such a great video. Have you seen it? I have, yeah. yeah, we, yeah. Were you bricking it? Uh, I actually wasn't, no, just because I know Matt and I know how good he hands. is. He's yeah. good. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I just, I, com I completely trust him. The, the only, actually, the only slight um sphincter worrying moment was when he got the saw out and he starts going through the fret slots but it's got a, the saw's got a stop on it yeah but if that was me you see i wouldn't have been able to get the saw in the fret slot i would have gouged half the fingerboard out on the way in You're like true temperament frets yeah <laughs> <laughs> you've got to bend them all <laughs> yeah on your 60 one <laughs> yeah so yeah. Anyway, and Rand says, and also a special thank you to Adrian for the camoufla camouflage heavy water combo. Um, the core of my sound, no matter the rig, scintillating tone and sonic bliss. Oh, yeah. thank you very much. Mm. Yep. As uh, people will know, the camouflage is, is a staple on my board. Absolutely love it. It's, you know, But, you know, we do feature a lot of your pedals on the show and there is... You know, from whether it's the the warthog or the heavy water, which but you know sort of blew us blew us both away. We were late to the party. Yeah, yeah. We eventually, we're blown but away. Yeah, yeah, we're late to the party on most things. Let's yeah. be fair. Yeah. Um, Never knowingly first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. There we go. New strap line. Yeah, yeah. New strap line. New That's T-shirt. <laughs> but yeah, we'll get into um, you know, part of our chat where you know where all things thorpey come from like where, where when you're designing something how does that start you know what are you looking for so it's it, it's sort of changed of late because so when we first started it's like i wanted certain things right and so we start down that road yep. and then to, to i would say 80 percent of what we do is that way mm. but of late, we've had other people have wanted things. Oh, interesting. So they've gone, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Now, obviously, some things are beyond the laws of physics, and mm. we, we politely say, yep, no, we'll wait till we can... The science matches that. But in other times, we go, ah, oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. So, like, the Scarlet Tunic... An interesting tunic. idea is an interesting idea, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah and, yeah. like, it doesn't... So the Scarlet Tunic's an idea, was an idea mm. by Lee, Lee Harris, and we went... Yeah, why not? So Lee Harris, people don't know, great guitar player. Um, used to play guitar in the Blockheads, and now plays guitar in Source of Full of Secrets, um, oh. which uh, is the um, drummer boy Nick Mason. Nick Mason. That. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and they're doing you know a bunch of the older. It's um, a mix, isn't it? It's, it's pre sort of sort of Sid Barrett era, right? And then post Sid Barrett era, yeah. and we saw them live in Guildford and. Not Guildford, Oxford. Right. They were at Guildford too, but um, I saw them in Oxford and it was great. It's a great yeah, show. I went and saw them, uh, yeah, again, pre, was it pre-COVID? Anyway, like early doors. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. And, and what was so amazing was, so like, the, the fans for that era, Floyd, are like, really really full on yeah, and pa so passionate about it. absolutely and they treated that music with so much respect and you know they knew that okay there's certain things here we absolutely have to get right but i think more so for me it was because there's so much spirit of experimentation with that music yeah and that is they went into that as well and it's, yeah really great they just did a really great job yeah uh dr balchin says apparently a lot of digital mixers have it built in 
So it'd be some sort of gate, apparently, for turning the levels up and down. What's that? The ducking. In the uh, in the TV studio. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, Dr. Belchin. Uh, one. There was a question here for Thorpey. Uh, what's your favourite non-Thorpey pedal? Oh, see, this changes, but I, uh, I'm, I would say I have favourite builders. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, that's from Eagle Ray Rob, by the way. Hi, Rob. How you doing? Kingsley. Yeah. I just love what he does. Yeah. yeah. You shouldn't open them. No, don't. But because they're high voltage. But anyway, I've opened them and they're immaculate. Yeah. And so I, I look in them and I think, oh, that's a work of art. I, to be fair, if I could have it so it was see through and still sort of, you know, <laughs> electrically noise cancelling, I'd, I'd, have, I'd have that. Um, just because I'm amazed at the, his craftsmanship. And his, it is incredible, right? Yeah. That's what, when you said, don't open them, I thought, yeah, don't open them because it's just not fair to everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it is, when you think of, you know, I think up until recently, you know, he was a one-man band, you know, designing and making everything by himself and how he, that build quality in there is just outrageous. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you think, and I look at that and think, wow, if I was pricing a pedal like that, it'd be four times what he charges. Yeah, so, I, I mean, this I've said to people in the past, like, oh, these are really good value. It, value and price are two different things. Yeah, right? you go. Yeah, value, you go. they are great value. And yeah. if it wasn't his work, my favourite pedal probably is uh, the Moog MF104M Super Delay. Oh, hello. Oh, nice. is, it, is that the white one? It, they do have a white version. Yeah. But this is the one with 1.2 seconds of okay. delay. Yeah. So I've got that at home. Um I so just I've got bought, a Moog I, stuff. Is that yeah, just yeah, like yeah, yeah. four chips then? Or how do they yeah, get yeah. 1.2? So you open, again, shouldn't open them up, but you yeah. know. You open them up <laughs> and you can see these four um, original Matsushita MN3005s lined up in a nice little row. No wow. way. Yeah. And then a boatload of SMD. It right. is, I, I, you look at it and think, oh, looks like a city. <laughs> <laughs> a very tiny city. Tiny city, yeah. <laughs> little ants. Oh, yeah, ants would be big in that city. <laughs> a very... <laughs> Sorry, uh, Jason Thompson glad you guys are back he said the EV episode got me thinking my Blues Junior compared to my Princeton is very mid-range focus uh, they don't balance well in wet dry wet would you change uh, would changing the speaker help if so do you have a suggestion um, use a pedal yeah uh, Mr Thorpe has come in with a good good answer you could just you could tweak it up with an EQ pedal or a different drive pedal just to change that. You, you can, you certainly can change the EQ of the amp with the speaker, mm. but whether it would be enough, enough for what you want, and it, it's a, it's a lot of eggs to throw into one basket. You get the speaker and it doesn't quite change it the way you want it, and then you try again and then you try again, by which point you're three hundred dollars in on speakers, whereas you could just get an EQ pedal and. and and tweak it might be an easier way to do it yeah probably yes the speaker will make a massive difference but like you will have seen in that episode some speakers i think when you're designing an amplifier it's why the speaker choice is such a massive part of it and it's approached with um it is part of the amp design it's not an afterthought it's not we'll design the amp and then we'll see what speaker we can throw at it and see what sounds good you know, it's it's it is that, you know, we're going to design this, and part of that is the speaker sound. They you know they have thoughts about that right at the outset, um, but absolutely, there are definitely things to try. I mean, those um, for me, greenbacks and blues in most things I try, I I like, in the lower wattage amps, um, but yeah, there's a a myriad of great options you could you know you could have a go but i do like the eq idea you know just notch out the things that you're not happy with yeah also do you've you've probably already done this but i can't tell you the number of amps that i've had where i haven't gone to the full extent of the eq controls because mm -hmm. you might find even though it says treble on it it's actually doing quite a lot of mid-range and there's a lot of guitar amps where the bass knob does a huge amount of mid-range right so you might find tweaking it in a different way try extreme settings of things mm. like presence and bass and and just really really you know go for it on the eq and don't be scared about having things on zero you might find something that works for you uh, before you leap for the credit card indeed 
Uh, Michael Corrigan. Michael Corrigan. Um, one question for us and one for Thorpe in a sec. Uh, he says, hey guys, what cab and speaker combos do you think I should own before I can just focus on amp heads and not match the cabinets? Right now I have an open back 1x12 EV and an open back 2x12 2 rock cab. What should I add? So that would suggest to me that you are looking at more 6L6 platforms. You like the headroom. Yeah, because if you're talking EL84 amps or EL34 amps or, you know, that sort of thing, it's a different approach. But if, if that, if the EV thing and the, the two rock thing is what tickles your fancy, um, I mean... You're starting. You, you're starting off strong. Your cab game is already very, very strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say try some greenbacks. There's there are few things in the world that sound any more pleasing than than four greenbacks in a Marshall cab. Oh man, absolutely. And it works with a wide variety of amps as well. Mm. Um, as Dan said, you know, you've got your two rock speakers and your EVs over here. Your Greenbacks and your lower powered Celestians and and all that is, is a completely different response. You got any speaker preferences? I like I do like Celestians in in the round. Yeah, but I like to mix them in a cab as well. So I like a Al Nico uh, cream, you know mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. yeah. the higher powered one after they've broken in because they're a bit tight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they need a bit of bre a bit of breaking in. But I also like to oh which one is it? It's the six. It's a Heritage Roller Celestian sixty five oh, wow. watt. I, th I forget. I forgive me. I, it'll come back to me in a yeah, minute. But those two are great. I particularly like it. It just seems to be like the greenback sound, but higher. Yeah. Higher. I wattage. think that um, for a long time was Robin Ford's favorite speaker. That's where it's, I got it from. From yeah. Mitch. Oh wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that's the right speaker. The G twelve sixty five. I think end. is what yeah, it is. That's yeah. That's it. Yeah. With the medium magnet. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I've got that in a lot of cabs, but I've, I've got a cab switcher, and I, I like. It's amazing what they do. Mm. Um. And, and what, how different they sound through yeah, different yeah. cabs. It's a bit of an eye opener. And some sound terrible yeah. through. Yeah, right. I must try. I haven't really had a good listen to those. I must try some of those. What cab switcher do you use? Uh, it's an Ampeat one, four four four. It's on a MIDI yeah. thing. It's quite. It's just cool for, especially for when you're developing stuff. Because I can you just, just switch. Quickly, yeah, nice. And because your your brain's only got a certain proper memory to deal with sound it's like milliseconds so you can go dink uh, okay mm -hmm. you get a proper ab mm -hmm. yeah actually that's a question i bet loads of people would love to know this and apologies if someone else has already asked it when you're developing a pedal then how do you choose a test rig that covers bases for enough people i own lots of amps right and lots of cabs i mean it's really uh, probably not as many as you i think but uh, <laughs> I've, but i've got different like even if I don't like an amp, I've I have that amp yeah, yeah, right. because um, I mean we test all our pedals for a Fender Hot Rod Deluxe because it's ubiquitous yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. the Mark IV one is, is you know it makes sense, but some amps are more difficult than others. So mm. this isn't a I'm not being disparaging to Orange. Orange have got a very orange yeah. sound, yeah. so I've got a Rock of Mark III, and I know that I can get a pedal to work through that mm. and and still do its thing then that's good. Yeah. A, cool. And a high watt and a Soldano and I mix them all up. Yeah, so you do go through a wide range of stuff. Yeah, everything from Fender to Marshall-y, tight cleans. I mean, I choose my amps a bit weird. Like I've got a Cornford Mark 50 Mark II for that British sound, mm -hmm. just because I like that amp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. amazing. Amp. You've also got the most outrageous, the audio kitchen that you've got. So that was lent to me very kindly right. by Steve, but um, it had to go back. It's, oh, did it's it? Pretty, it, I think it was Ed O'Brien's actual <laughs> amp, so I, okay. <laughs> so I couldn't keep it. Right. Uh, but it was a, um, yeah, that thing was, I have, I have never heard an amp that loud yeah. in my life. So the ch big chopper, yeah, but bigger. Yeah. Wow. Um, I've got a water. It's insane, one. man. It's absolutely outrageous. What's in it then? Oh, yeah, KT88. We're talking about KT88, isn't it? We're talking That's about cool. Audio Kitchen, uh, which is the maker of that blue amp you can see at the back there. They almost, they also make uh, the big trees and the little trees the and a bunch of other chopper. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep, I keep calling him Steve Kitchen, but his name is not Steve Kitchen. It is Steve, Steve Crow. Crow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Three KT88s. It's, it was. I've never heard an amp that loud, and I've got a high one. Well, yeah, yeah. What in it's, parallel or something then? But just, I don't know. I think he's doing a single-ended thing. Yeah. And massive transformers, crazy I mean. transformers. Oh, wow. it's, oh, cool. it's like trying to lift three SVTs 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you could actually just use it for it. Yeah, to work out. Work you out could. With, yeah. um, <laughs> it was that heavy. It was <laughs> mental. <laughs> Yeah. Um, anyway, Michael, so we'd say take a step um, towards... I would have a listen to some Alnico speakers. Because what, what you have currently is like the polar opposite of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, have a listen to some Alnicos. You, it sounds like you might prefer some of the higher power ones. Uh, Thorpey was talking about the Celestine Alnico cream. It's not cheap, but by golly, does it sound good. Yeah, it sounds really um, great. And if you're ever worried about the power handling of that, Simon Neal from Biffy Clyro uses one in an ISO cab on the end of his 100 watt. And hammers it so uh, hammers it and it yeah. sounds amazing yeah a nice nice thing uh dan herbert hi dan hey dan he says amazing show on friday really love all the nerdy guitar build and repair and maintenance vids thanks for sharing that mick uh question i'm still looking for the perfect overdrive uh for my princeton reverb reissue and 2020 american telly i love my ocd he mm -hmm. says so you want a nice overdrive pedal to go with your Princeton and your telly and you really like your OCD. We're assuming you want something different than the OCD. If it, you could try the Thorpey Peacekeeper or the Thorpey Warthog or... <laughs> <laughs> Very kind. <laughs> Blackstone MOSFET. Oh, nice yeah. shout. Yeah, we so don't talk about that a lot, actually. Yeah. That's no. a really good yeah. pedal for that amp. I got one of those at Chandler's once years ago. Uh, well, yeah. At Charlie Chandler's Guitar Experience. It also depends where you want to go in the gain range. If, let's say you're using your OCD for the higher gain stuff because it does a really great job of that. Things like um, Greer Lightspeed as well for the lower gain stuff into a, into a Peacekeeper. I mean, we, we use the Lightspeed a lot. Really great uh, low gain pedal into a cleaner platform because then, then it comes down to how you're using yeah. uh, the amp. It's one of those amps that between you go between two and four and you in that space you've got three vastly different amplifiers yeah, yeah, yeah. you know so and the lower it, down on the volume knob you kind of want some mid push don't you yeah so it, it's almost forgive the simplification but as you turn it up you want to go from your famous green mid boosted overdrive by the time the princeton's up at seven or eight you mm -hmm. want you don't want any of that at all. You want something much more neutral sounding. A boost would work really great. Mm -hmm. So in between there, you're sort of you're taking more mid range out because as you turn it up, it com really comes through in the overdrive of that amp. So maybe think about how loud do you run it, how overdriven do you run it, what are you aiming for, and you should be able to pair away quite quickly stuff that would that would fit. Yeah, that's one of those amps that I uh, I had a little while ago and I changed the speaker in. So I went for, I think it was less efficient. So it went down from like 100 dB down to 97. So half as efficient, lowered the volume, mm. able to crank it up a little bit past four, mm. get a bit more drive out of it. And I think it, it was a Raging Cajun oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It worked really well. Um, speaker warehouse or? Uh, no, no, it's Eminence. Eminence, Eminence. 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 Matt Schofield really likes those those speakers. Yeah, that worked really well with that. Oh, uh, nice. Because it just got a bigger magnet. Yeah. So it seemed to handle the low end a little bit Interesting. better. Interesting. Yeah, we we've got a two by ten Celestian Gold cab that we put ours through and flipping, flipping how that sounded really good. Actually, we need to send it back to Fender. Sorry, Fender, you'll never watch this, but we do need to send it back. Um, uh, yeah, good luck, Dan. Um, Todd Roy says I would try a Nobles, and Matt Miller says the Dane could work. Yeah. To be fair, the Dane works on most things. It's a awesome, yeah. awesome sounding thing. Well, genuinely, not just because he sat here. I was also going to say the Heavy Water. I've I've come to a bit of a revelation. I've got a two rock TS one that is the essentially the Dumble Overdrive special sound, and I've done two gigs with it now, and really struggling to to get an overdrive pedal that that sit. I mean, don't get me wrong, it sounds pretty stellar whatever you plug into it, <laughs> but I t suddenly have this had this revelation of going. I know what will work. Yeah, heavy water, because I don't want. Do you use both sides at the same time or? Either or, because oh, okay. it's got an overdrive channel as well. Yeah. Okay. And what I don't really want to do is is change the sound of the amp. Yeah. At all, I, I've 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 gone from being that person who's all about loud, open, clean amp, million different overdrive pedals to this amp sounds perfect. Yeah. But I do need to push it. A bit, I do yeah. need to have higher and lower levels, and I think I'm going to try it. Yeah. So heavy water is uh, is his two sided um, boost pedal, and I. It's the loudest boost pedal I've ever heard. 
it's pretty mental. Yeah, I don't. I, I, that was one of those ones where yeah, hats off to uh, to Danish Pete. You know, we were going to go a different way with that pedal. Uh, sorry, the reason I mention him is because it's the boost side from the Dane. Yeah, and then. He, I, I was asked, oh, can you just release the boost? I was like, oh, well, I, I will, but I'll just do two boosts because I wanted to, and I'll, I'll change one. So he really needed that. What what you were after, really, is just the my amp, my sound, but louder, mm. and and that collapsing into the um, the drive works really well, and it retains high end when you roll your volume back. Yeah. And I think that's the key thing, because it just allows you to use your guitar more for control sure nerdy question then how do you achieve that is it a, an input impedance thing or is it something else oh right okay um it, I, with regards to that it is literally so clean all the way cranked right and because you've got control over the lows at, at, as well it it doesn't change your signal that much it's it says the louder it goes, the just the bigger your guitar gets. And so it's not imparting too much character. And so it doesn't get muddy when you roll it down. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, it's got a very high input impedance as well. Uh, so interesting. There's, there's, interesting. there's a little bit of sparkle there to start yeah. with. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Okay, um, yeah, good luck, Dan. Yep. Uh, Airfire, Ed, hello, mate. Hey, Hope buddy. You're doing all right. He says, what's the best guitar-related way to celebrate a promotion? Uh, which 65 I Fender Telecaster <laughs> I find a, an exquisite way to celebrate any promotion Ed <laughs> he says I happily secured during your holly bobs great to have you guys back Ed congrats mate congrats that, mate that's, that's nice to hear congratulations uh, on, your, on your new job there um, well I mean any guitar shaped acquisition is good isn't it or pedal shaped or amp shaped I think you should mark these moments as well definitely it's, it's important yeah I generally mark it Tuesday with a new guitar. <laughs> um, just take an afternoon for it. Like, literally, just take the afternoon off, go and sit down in a shop yeah. and play this stuff and, and, and fiddle with it and walk away with what you love as opposed to just choosing something. And see if you can do the... Um, uh, the Wayne. The Wayne's World. How oh. do I know what you're thinking about? <laughs> That's symbiosis, that is. Yeah. Okay, Wayne, time to put it away. Not today, my good sir. Do you take to ting cash? <laughs> I, actually, I like what you said about going to going somewhere and trying some stuff out. Yeah. It might be that that experience of doing that is actually, and even if you walk out empty-handed, that alone is a good enough guitar reward, isn't it? Yeah. Going to learn something new and try something out. Go to there's some really great uh, retailers that have some wonderful guitars, and the. The great thing about that is if you try a lot of stuff, you might find something that you'd never considered before and find something that you just think suits you. Um, sir. Sir, suits you, sir. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a great shout. Go and take an afternoon off and go and visit one of the many fine establishments. Yeah, bit of tire kicking. Yeah, man, have some fun. <laughs> um, Michael Giliberto. Hi, Michael. Hi, Mike. He says, welcome back. Hope you all enjoyed the break. Enjoyed uh, the Friday shows. How about a comparison of the TS1 to the CRS with Juggler as a second channel? I like that. I do like that. I have thought about doing a video on the two of them because lots of people want to know what the principal difference is. They are very, very different amps. Um, Can we do it tomorrow? That'd be fun. We could. I'm a little bit nervous about doing a two rock promo, if I'm honest. Okay. Even though... They well, are the two best guitar amps I've ever heard in my life. I'll just put some gaffer tape over the front of them and we'll just call them Amp A and Amp B. Yeah, and we'll pretend. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I might do it. It's just... Okay, you tell us what you think. It... We're really happy to do shows like that, but I I sort of feel like they're they're better off as vlogs. Okay. Because all the people who don't like two rocks are like, man, I just want to see some pedals. Okay. Let us know what you think. If you want us to do it, we'll do it. Or I'll just do it. Well, we'll put it out not as a Friday show. Okay. I'm going around in circles here. Um, they are very different, though, and I'd, I'd be interested in sharing both of our thoughts on that. I would, I'd just be so much fun. Yeah. I'd love to do it. I am surprised how different they are. Wow, really? Yeah. So, anyway. Okay. Um, and a good, good idea, Michael, using the juggler in the, in the CRS to create that dumbly noise. Eagle Ray Rob. G'day, mate. He says, I've missed the live Q&A, but you left us with some fantastic episodes during your holiday. It's nice to have you back. 
I love my Thorpey Peacekeeper. Yeah. I'm thinking of adding a heavy water. Is there too much overlap between the two? There's no overlap. Yeah. They're very different things. Yeah, very much so. They work well together, mm. either before or after. I mean, I'm talking about the heavy water before or after the Peacekeeper. I'd probably put the heavy water before the Peacekeeper because if you put it afterwards, you're just going to get a really loud Peacekeeper. Especially into your uh, two rock. Yeah. Rob, uh, uh, that's... I, I am a big fan of it into the two rock because it's like, how can this thing be any more massive? And yeah, that's one way of doing it. Uh, yeah, as he said, into the Peacekeeper, you could really smash the Peacekeeper into super crazy heavy overdrive yeah. you? because mm. you're hitting it really hard from the, the front. So yeah, nice. Um, other options, if you wanted something uh gainier and grittier and the opposite of a clean boost oh that's my mum um she obviously has no idea i do this on a monday bless you mum um uh then um another big uh a, one that dan and i really like is the warthog sits somewhere between i i always think anyway mm. it sits somewhere between a distortion and a fuzz as you gain it up a bit more yeah, it's a remarkable sound. It's, it's such a direct sounding feeling pedal to play as a matter of fact we today um we did an interview with guitarist mag and that came out as one of our um the underrated pedals or yeah yeah oh thanks yeah because i mean the thing is we can plug that into any rig and get a sound out of it that's absolutely killer, whether it is a, just goosing something a little bit or like a full-on mm. direct transistor distortion thing. It's I just... used it for the Cream tribute gigs. Right. Yeah, it was really amazing. Really great for that. So that makes so I yeah, this is years ago. So you feel me? You you actually had an input on this because it was going to be called the Chameleon at the time, because it was um, I brought it round to you at the same time I brought the gunshot round. And the reason it was going to be called the Chameleon is because it can do a, a lot of stuff from boost right. all the way through to fuzz. But it was your input helped EQ that because, as you said at the time, there was a th like a almost like a millisecond delay on the low end that was coming through on the prototype. Right. And so we, we ended up taking that back and tweaking it to tighten that up. And so it, it ended up being what it was. I thought it was great before, but yeah, it, yeah. after having you go, no, the low end, there's something funny about the low end, we tightened it up and actually ended up, it was sat on for a few months until we released it. But yeah, it ended up being your influence that tightened it Oh man, it, so. actually, oh, you know what? Because we, having you here, because we've never, how long ago did, did you come over to my house? Where we had that chat. About when I said I was going to go try and go pro. Yeah. Yeah, it was 2014 that was. Oh, man, actually, we, it was before it was then, before but then. it was before then. It was might be 2000 and, it was 2008. So a friend of mine, uh, a mutual friend of ours, um, I was playing a pedal at, at his place, um, Mitch Keane, who hey. actually works for both of us. Yeah, he just works for... <laughs> and anyway, he had, he had this box... And, uh, you know, a nondescript box with some knobs on it. And just playing it. it sounded amazing. Um, I've still got it. I think I've got it here. Uh, and it was a Red Llama clone. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, what? That thing is flipping awesome. He says, oh, yeah, my mate makes them. And and I'd already known you sort of very briefly because I think we had an email. Anyway, I reached out and said, oh, could you make me one as well? And you did, and that's how we sort of... And I got this red llama back, and I used it for ages. It was, was that those, the cookies and cream one? Like white and... Uh, I think it's purple, mine. That, you've got a white and other one pedal that I've made. Oh, no, well. that was the that was the um, BC109 fuzz yeah, 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 you made yeah, for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway. Sorry. So, <laughs> yeah. originally, um, because you know, your time in the army, and you, the story you told me was you, you used to build these pedals, because as a guitar player, you found it helped distress you and give you a different focus and stuff and they were just flipping awesome so I, I think i got three pedals clones that you made and they were fantastic anyway we became friends and the thorby comes over to my house what, what year did we say it was 2000, 2008 yeah oh, 2000 it was it was yeah this is three houses ago for me yeah, so yeah. it's a really long time ago 
and he came over and says, I'm thinking about doing this. Yeah. And we had a cup of tea, a chat, and and, uh, and then he went off and did it and hey. did Dolby Pedals. It was are. wicked. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? No, it's, but it's amazing. <laughs> and, and I mean, I always knew that if you could, um, there's a lot of great manufacturers out there, but I knew that there was the stuff that you'd made and the ideas that you had for the designs and everything that you had, I knew that if you could uh, actually get what, you know, the stuff that you'd made, if you could actually produce that in a way, in, in numbers and get it out to people, I knew you'd nail it because um, it's kind of great. But then you the whole Thorpey brand, which is just flipping yeah. awesome. Yeah. It's so good. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. And no mean feat in a in a in a world where there are so many pedals, so many Me Too products to have something so unique yeah. and so instantly identifiable, a by the look, but b by the way you make them. I think yeah, yeah. fair dues. Really great, yeah, thank you. Yeah, really yeah, great. Yeah, fair dues. Um, now then, a Joski official, Joski official wants to wants to know. Um, I'm doing my thesis on frequency response of different guitar build types. Have you got any suggestions? For things I should watch out for, different yeah. guitar build types. Yeah, so if you put, presumably you're looking at things like bolt-on necks and and set necks and through necks and double cuts and single cuts and all that kind of stuff, and what is the frequency response of those build choices? So the most important thing I think to say about that is that it's not what those things add; it's what they take away. So if you think about, you've got. We talk about sine waves and that sort of stuff when we, you know, when we think about talking about sound, right? But natural fact, if you, if you, if you just strum open strings and you looked at that through an oscilloscope, it's just noise, noise, because <laughs> yeah. there is so much going on. Um, so you, you need to look at it uh, in a like a um, a frequency scanner. But even then. It's only a snapshot it's of that snapshot. specific point in time. Yeah, so, yeah. but the way to think about it is that the you've got this. If you imagine you start with all the frequencies, you know, from really low to really high, and they're all uniform. When you start adding things to the body and the neck, you start taking away those frequencies. And the more things that you add, the more these you get these little notches. And so that's what the the timber and and all that sort of stuff does. It's not adding stuff. It's, it might be taking away less stuff than one nick, but it's always about yeah. taking those things away. So you've got a variable in the timber itself, and I appreciate that it's believed by some people that it doesn't make any difference. It does. <laughs> it would be interesting to maybe if if you if the scope is there to do it in your thesis, the effect of um, build types on frequency response is one thing, but then there's another variable in there, which is amplitude, is volume. So where are you measuring it? Mm. Are you plugging a jack plug into the guitar and measuring what's coming out the pickups, or are you miking an amp and measuring that? And are you doing it at 80 dB, or are you doing it at 110 dB? Because I rather suspect that the results will be very different, especially when the guitar starts reacting with whatever's coming out of that speaker. So as a snapshot of here's what the guitar's putting out of the jack socket, that's quite interesting. Mm. But then what happens at 110 dB? Yeah, yeah, Because yeah, it's yeah. probably a, a completely different kettle of um, coconuts at that point. He's got to try and reduce the amount of variables somehow. Yeah. I'd start with inducing um, movement of the string, so rather than doing a pick, because oh, okay. he isn't going to get... Con he's got to have constant results, and they've got yeah. to be all the same to start with. Yeah. So if he did something like... A, do you know, like a fisherman, um, not not fish, a fisherman. Do you know the magnet? The oh, magnet? like an Evo, Evo type thing. thing. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. needs to create an Evo that puts out a specific amplitude, specific voltage, and, and right. move the string. Make sure the strings are the same, yeah. same brand, same. All the rest of it. He's got to reduce the amount of variables. He isn't going to be able to measure it. There's too many variables, which is why tone wood doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, but yeah. you can't. Yeah. Somehow he's got to. Yeah. reduce the amount of difference interesting so perhaps then given that in in the good scientific tradition you know 
reducing variables and having a very definite question and some measurable, disprovable and provable outcomes is the right way to go. Maybe your question could be narrowed a little bit. Is there something more specific you're actually asking rather than that huge question? Can you look specifically at neck joint? Can you look specifically at timber? Like, could you look specifically at the weight of the frets? <laughs> yeah. You, but both, all, yeah, both yeah. Dan and I have been astounded how different our guitars sounded after the refret, yeah. which is partially down to the material of the frets, but it's also down to how they're seated. Mm -hmm. All that stuff. Also down to how you know well the nuts put in. My 61 Strat had a little plastic shim underneath the nut. No way. Yeah, because whoever did the redid the nut didn't want to throw the original nut away, presumably. And it definitely had some blood on it. <laughs> <laughs> That matters. DNA matters. Yes. <laughs> and well, I, blood I, DNA. I was saying to Matt, I wonder if we could get some and clone Leo Fender, because I reckon it was Leo... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the actual story was it was Leo Fender's lunchbox. Uh, <laughs> and he was working on that guitar that day. That's what it was. Is this like a Jurassic Park episode? <laughs> Here he is in amber, <laughs> yeah. Leo Fender. <laughs> Don't. He's going to get angry. May he rest in peace. May he rest in peace. Uh, by, by which tangent leads us to the next question. Good luck with the thesis. Yeah, good, good luck, luck mate. Um... Uh, Wastel10 says, um, I know good soldering is the best connection, but I've seen some awful things in guitars. Snap. Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on using plugs for pickup connections? Um, it, so, I think a lot of people are concerned about the dry joint, but think about it. The pickups go to a pickup selector. That's a dry joint there. Then that goes into pots. That's a that's a dry joint. It's a, it's a contact joint on the um, the uh, resistive film, and that goes out to a jack. That's a dry joint there. So it's not as if you know your pickups are direct uh, connected directly to a lead that's connected directly into the. When you say valve. a dry joint, do you mean just a connection? Sorry, I meant, rather not, than a, a not a it's not a dry solder joint. It's a it's a contact joint. It's not a solder joint. It's yeah, a. Yeah. It's a. Um, it's a term I'm looking for. It's a point of contact. It's a, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, in that sense, you know, we have those solderless contact joints in the guitar, and they've been working fine, you know, for a long time. Um, as long as the connector is good then it's why not it's fine I, I saw some concerned faces coming from you oh, i don't know i mean they use molexes in gibson guitars now don't they on the standard a mm. molex is a connector yeah and like you say in fact they're used in all sorts they're i mean they're used in pedals sorts. yeah some people use them in pedals some people use them in computers all the rest of it as long as the compressions yeah. the springs so the, we're talking drum, about something like a little crocodile a little um no what are they called butterfly little joint yeah, that sort of thing it's like a white plastic block that goes over a set of pins like that a, yeah. and there's a little click out of the little hook out of the top so when you put it in it goes click the, yeah the drama comes when you constantly in and out in and out in and out because at that point you reduce the compression that's on the spring and mm. then then you could have a flaky contact always think Sold, soldering done well is better it's yeah. the same yeah. with cables as well but um, just because it flows through and you've yeah. got more we, I was having a discussion with my friend Neville just recently so we're going to make a video he has a um, Gibson Memphis 63 335 the cherry red with the block inlays that one the Clapton guitar basically um, and I've got a 58 style natural one and we're going to change the pickups in both of them do before and afters and do it together and he's saying, I oh, just uh, bear in mind, he worked for Gibson. So he's he's put loads of pickups in Gibson guitars in his time. Mm. And he's like, I just don't know if I can be asked with um, all the soldering. Can I use connectors? And my reaction's a bit like yours. It's like, heaven forfend, you should do anything that they didn't do in 1963. But of course, yeah, I, I don't know if there's a an electronic reason. Well, like, look at your audio any, jack. Any... It in, that's not soldered in, is it? You so put, it doesn't it, plug like, it in. create yeah. any extra capacitance or no, it won't do. It if as long as the connection is good, it's like um, if it oxidizes, it's rubbish. Yeah, but okay. that's the same with 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 any connection. Like if if your pickup selector oxidizes, you're going to run into the same trouble. Okay, you know. So then then the next question is, what is the likelihood of it oxidizing? If you sweat all over your guitar every night, how much more likely in a hollow body guitar is it likely to sweat that little? connection than it is one in there it's not you're, no. you, because 
this is open, your pickup selector is open, that's going to oxidize way before yeah. a connector that's in the yeah. body of the guitar. So, you know. I did see a thing uh, two days ago on the internet. It looked amazing. It was a guy who got a hollow body and he couldn't be bothered to route them all through the F hole. Right. Well, I'm not sure they go through the F hole, but it was either the F hole or the bridge pickup. Mm -hmm. And um, because he couldn't be bothered to do that, he got a junior hacksaw and cut a little window in the back of his guitar. <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and he he said, "I don't care. This 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 works for me because I can't see very well." I was like, "Ah, oh, fair enough. It's his gear. He can do what he likes." It was a big window, <laughs> but <laughs> it was a lovely guitar with this big hole in it. Um, but yeah, do that. Do that to Neville's uh, vintage <laughs> three three five. <laughs> yeah, I've got you. Let's go for it. Yeah. Don't drill a hole in it. <laughs> there you go. People who are familiar with my guitar repairing skills will, would not be surprised by that. Um, <laughs> uh, audio files use plugs and cables to connect their systems. Maybe it's more a cable issue than a plug issue. Says Silver Gaines MC. Yeah, why not? There must be a reason because it is such an unbelievably obvious thing to do. The yeah, I don't know. Oh, man. I, you know, if you think about the, the... The electronics on this guitar have been the same since 1952, right? Vaguely. And I just don't think back then when they designed these guitars, they were expecting you to be swapping in pickups in and out. I don't think that was a massive consideration. It's like, that's it. If anything breaks, buy another guitar. Well, you know. yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was conceived as a parts machine so that parts could be replaced, but... Maybe they thought you'd be replacing the neck before you'd replace the pickups. Yeah, or maybe. I don't know. I mean, and oh, I've got an answer. Go on then. Those plugs don't fit down the holes that they're drilled in the guitar, do they? So, say you've got like a Les Paul, you're changing the pickups on it. You've got a big old bulbous there plastic. There you go. Thing. There yeah. you go. So how the yeah, hell's yeah. that going to get in? So yeah. where does the connection? So you go? have so to you have crimp to it onto. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, so when you're changing the pickups, and actually this is this is relevant to to what you're going to do. For him to do that, he's going to have to crimp and uncrimp the plugs. So he's replacing soldering with, with crimping. really fiddly crimping. Yeah. I just solder. And then you've got to keep them apart, so you'd have to insulate them and you'd have to tie them on somewhere inside the guitar so they don't rattle about, Yep. et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Uh, Either, whatever you do, if you do put a plug on there, you've still got to solder the connection to, from the plug to the pickup selector. There still is going to be soldering involved. You know, so, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jean, Jean Yohung wants to know, did Mick refret with stainless steel or nickel? Um, yeah, standard uh, nickel silver type frets. Um, stainless is amazing. It just sounds too bright for me. Mm -hmm. uh, not the right thing for an old, for my old Strat anyway. So I do know loads of people that love it. Interestingly enough, Matt showed me a fret wire um, that was gold in colour that apparently is as, almost as hard as stainless steel, but sounds like nickel. That was the one he had on his purple telly. Yeah. Did you play that thing? Uh, no, it I didn't. It is amazing. I looked at it and just went, oh, yeah, well, you know, whatever. And I picked it up and I couldn't put it down. It was brilliant. Yeah. So um, I totally would have gone with it if uh, it wasn't gold. Um, what? Sorry. If it wasn't gold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I agree because it, it, yeah. it looks weird. Yeah, yeah. If it was a maple neck, though, you can get away with the gold. It looks good. And a Mary Kay. Mary Kay strap with gold. Yeah, that would be yeah. really cool. Nice. Yeah. That'll work. Yeah. Um, let's move on. Um, Wit Anderson. Hello, Wit. He says, by Ooh. dumb luck, I was able to catch Joe Bonamassa at Red Rocks. Ah, oh, wow. While travelling, what a show and what a venue. The display of vintage guitar porn was almost too much for me to handle. Much love from New Jersey. There was, he played the two nights from memory. The first night was very rainy. Right. Uh, I think the second night rainy was... Rainy Red Rocks. Rainy Red Rocks. Mm. Um, wet Rocks. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, yeah, one of the uh, among the many things we love about Joe Bonamassa is that... Uh, that uh, idiotic guitar collection he has he does take some of the prize pieces out on the road with him and he should be forever commended for that but the my favorite memory of hanging out with joe for that couple of days and he was here so uh we were invited down you couldn't make it the first day and i was like yeah I'll just go down you know 
Now I thought we we're just going down to hang out. Is it at um, the Albert Hall? As you do. As you do. Yeah. I thought, yeah, you know, great because um, you know I've known uh, Josh Smith for a long time, yeah. and you know we, we're mates and stuff. And went down there, and Josh says, "Oh, do you want to film something?" I'm like, "I mean, yeah, of course, would love to," but I, I, you know, he says, "Well, you know, come back tomorrow." I'm like, okay, great. But anyway, the first night I was down there. Um, you know, we're on stage and, and, and Joe's just starts handing me guitars to have a look at. And <laughs> he's pretty bonkers. And I'm like, oh, uh, you know, I talk, and I said, um, oh, you know, I, I have played a, a, a burst before, but I think there's something with a neck. And he's, he hands me this guitar and goes, well, this is what a burst neck should feel like. And he hands me the, what do you call it, the red dot or whatever. And, and it's just him and me on stage at the Albert Hall, and he's handing me these guitars, and I'm losing my mind. I'm and I'm trying to be cool. I'm failing absolutely, you know, pathetically. And it's like he just wants to hang out and talk about guitars. It's just like his brain is just full of guitars. And if there's someone there who shares an interest, he's like totally in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was amazing. You know, I oh. just really a, be a beautiful moment. I'll never forget. It's really cool. Did you get to play a V? Is it Amos? I don't think he didn't have the V with him. He didn't have it with That's him. That's my favourite. Yeah. Right. Not that I've played it, I, I, but I like the look of it. It's I such a some... cool guitar, isn't it? Nuts. Um, uh, Swizz871, Swizz871. Uh, Thorpey, I love the tunic so much, I might just make it my clean tone for the near future. I also use it to brighten up a Reeves Red Dot. The other day and it sounded great can't wait to keep exploring what it can do oh, amazing oh, thank you is it is your latest release is it yeah yeah it is yeah and give us a quick overview so it started off as a can you do this for lee harris for 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 uh, the source full of secrets tour but um sid was known for using and, and david gilmore early on as a selma treble and bass amp mm. it's a very specific sound it's got a very specific presence about it mm. uh, and it behaves in somewhere between i would suggest like a high watt and a vox and it sits in the middle of those two glorious amps um but it's got a lot of character about it so we were asked to emulate that amp so that you didn't have to take these vintage amps that are quite mm. fragile because they weren't yeah. made the best yeah right um i think josh smith bought one while he was here a few years ago right a, a oh Travelers. yes he did yes he did yeah so it's an amazing amp and we happen to have one um borrowed from dan uh, Coggins and um, yeah we we set out to emulate it and that's where the AB thing came in we're able to put the uh, Selma treble and bass against the Scarlet Tunic and AB them and when we got with Lee to the point where they were blind you couldn't tell the difference wow. Lee, no Lee was like I could only tell the difference because I knew that the Scarlet Tunic was lower noise floor than the <laughs> the real amp. That's a great trick uh, if you're ever if you're ever blind testing anything. Listen to the noise floor; it's a really great trick, and uh, that's as much as I'm going to say about that. So uh, yeah, we called it an analog amp emulator, but it does it does so much more than Sid sound. Sure. It, it just feels right. It feels like an amp. Yeah, everyone yeah. claims that, but it was set out. We set oh, out we to, to do that. We'll have to plug it in forthwith, yes. Daniel. Yes, and have schwangage. Yeah, nice. Yeah, um, James Green. Hey, James. James says, somehow it's more dangerous to have you guys on vacation than in the room. Uh, I wound up with a new Nash Jazzmaster, a Swart Atomic Junior and a veteran. <laughs> My <laughs> wallet thinks it's little wallet gods that you're back. Thanks. I, you I thank James. Ones. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> um... Uh, Mike2203, hello Mike. Hey Mike. Uh, Mike came to one of our experience days and indeed was there actually at the Whitney gig that you came to yes. when we did with Andy Timmons. That was awesome. Uh, Mike says, oh, have we awesome. got any experience with hardtail strats? I've never played one. Presumably they're stable in the tuning department and better in the sustain stakes. Thank you. Interesting. So the Andy Timmons strat is... Uh, he was searching for a, an old strap for a long time, and the one that he settled on was a 60s hardtail. And they are remarkable guitars. Um, they, they've got a different attack because you don't have the spring from the, uh, from the trem, unless the trem's decked. Uh, but even then, it's still, there's still a tension thing. The anyway. springs, even if the trem is decked or if you block it, 
whatever the springs are still vibrating Resonating. they're still part of the, the tone soup yeah but yeah they're 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 great for me though the tremolo is such a massive part of the strat thing mm. um i always say it just takes a step towards a telly a small yeah, yeah, yeah. step towards a telly yeah and i often tell the story that matt schofield used to have or maybe still has an ash body svl with a hard tail and he used to play it when he was in he did play a telly for some time and then he stopped playing the telly as a sort of second or third guitar and he used to cart around a 335 as well but then i think he got to the point where he was so focused in on strats he wasn't carrying other guitars with him and but one of the guitars he would carry with him was this ash body uh hardtail svl strat type guitar mm. and what struck me about that is when he was in real albert collins mode he would play that guitar oh wow yeah and because i think it also had a bass plate under the bridge pickup as I later learned, quite a few of his strats have a bass plate under the bridge pickup. Oh, cool. Anyway, it, for that reason, it just felt a step towards telly to me with the right. hardtail. Did he do it because it was a risk of snapping strings if he's going full Albert Collins? You know, a lot of bends. No, I think just the just again, even even when you deck that. That bridge, it's still there. The vibrato is still there. Mm. But when the, when it's just a hard tail on the body, the string tension is different because of where the strings anchor. And I just end, I think it ends up feeling more like a fixed bridge guitar. Yeah. I, I've never owned one, so I don't. I played a few, but um, and that could be purely psychosomatic, couldn't it? If that's what you're thinking. Plus, it's the ash body. Yeah. Mm. Our Chris Buck is on. Chris! Hello, hello, bud. Hello, mate. Hope you're doing well. So, because Thorpe is here, I'm allowed to, to say that, am I? Yeah, well, that I'm here. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Not that you're, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that thing with Chris. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah just... I, saw, I saw this clip on Facebook, right? And because I follow Chris on Facebook and he comes out, and he's in this quarry. And he comes out and he grabs his guitar and he plays this chord and there's this massive explosion. And as soon as I saw the explosion, I went, Thorpey, I bet that was you. And he comes into that and I go, did you do that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> oh, wicked. It was so good. So good. If anyone deserves to have massive explosive pyrotechnics going off them while they're playing guitar, it's, it's Chris. Chris Buck. <laughs> Absolutely. Hope you're well, mate. Hope you're well. Um... As for better in the sustained stakes, I, I'm not sure, Mike. I think if once you get to a certain volume, and I, I'm not sure how much more sustain you actually need. Strat will sustain really, really great. Um, but, you know, every component you add to a guitar will inhibit the sustain. So the fact that there are fewer moving parts, more of the bridges in contact with the body, theoretically anyway, yes, you will get a bit more sustain, I guess. Mr. Timothy Lurch is on. He says, hard tail strats are wonderful. Tele guy opinion. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. The, oh, the people who love them absolutely love them. Yeah. They're great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Marvin Box. Hello, Marvin. Hey, Marvin. He says, hi, guys. I have a bit of a struggle right now. I love my Les Paul Standard 2016, and I'm thinking of putting in PAF style pickups and vintage wiring. What are your thoughts? Can you please describe what it means when a guitar has come to life? Which is sometimes what we say when we put fifties wiring and old school pickups in a guitar. Yeah, yes, it's it's a really interesting question. Um, it's a difficult one, and it's difficult because your original statement says, "I love this guitar." Exactly. So my question is, then, why are you changing it? Yeah. Now, in the spirit of experimentation, that's that's one thing, and it's great. Um, you know do it i experimented with red originally and i, I honestly without a word of a lie I, I must have tried at least a dozen bridge pickups in that guitar at least probably more um from just mucking around with it thinking well surely there's got to be a better pickup than the pickup that it came with you know and i tried some just outrageously expensive pickups in that guitar always came back to the stock bridge pickup um, if it sounds good, it is good. Now, saying that though, um, in my Les Paul, I've got uh, OX4 pickups in that, yeah. and they're fantastic. However, I recently, 
after years of Mick telling me, I don't know if that's 50s wine. I thought, yeah, I'm just pretty sure like it is. It's 50s wine to me. Anyway, I opened it up. Of course, it's not 50s wine. <laughs> I changed it over to 50s wine, and the guitar goes, it just adds another level yeah. of, of stuff to that guitar that I like. And um, it might be what before you do anything, before you change pickups or anything, or change your harness and all that stuff, just check to see if it's 50s wired. Um, there's some great uh, diagrams and stuff on, on the interweb. Monty's has some really great diagrams. Yeah. And it might be that it's not 50s wired, and if you change it over to 50s wired, it might add something that you really like. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So the first question is why do you want to change it? Something that Matt said to me when I was having the 61 strap refretted, that's the most obvious thing in the world, but I never really thought about yeah. it in such obvious terms. He said the biggest change you can make to any guitar's t tone is having it set up right. Yeah. Right meaning in a way that you, you're really enjoying playing it. Now that might mean something as mundane as it really does need a fret job or the nut, the nuts need, uh, the nut needs cutting properly and all of that to improve things from a straight technical point of view or it might be a more um, subjective thing in terms of what you like to play but the difference I didn't change anything in 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 my uh, in the 61 strat and it was quite different after mm. the refret so mm. in, in a really great way that being said the live example would be my casino so I took out the original Epiphone P90s they were not great in my opinion don't get me wrong, you could get a really great sound out of it. And the video that we made on doing that pickup swap, it sounded flipping great with the old pickups. But putting the new ones in and the 50s yeah, wiring, amazing. it was like taking a blanket off yeah, the guitar. Amazing. It was literally like taking a blanket off it. And the, the, the sort of palpable results were the controls were far more usable throughout their range. Mm -hmm. So all the way down to three in terms of volume and tone variance. Whereas on the old guitar... And the old pickups, not really. It was pretty much unusable after about seven on any of the controls. Just yeah. everything just turned to mud and disappeared. So, if what you're in, what you're feeling with that guitar at the moment is, yeah, it sounds great when it's cranked, um, but when I roll the volume and tone back, maybe it disappears, goes a bit muddy. I think that's the prime case where more vintage type pickups and fifties wiring can have a palpably massive effect. Yes. Um, uh, Marvin Box says it's a PCB modern wiring. So it's okay, just strip it out. It's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that will changing it over to a nice, you know, uh, what do they call it? the the um, fifty wiring, loom. yeah, and the loom and that sort of stuff. Yeah, you know, if you've got good pickups, it's. Changing the loom has as much difference from going from good pickups to amazing pickups. Yeah. You know, if you've got good pickups and you change the loom, it has, a, you know, a similar jump in in uh, appreciable yeah. difference. For sure, you will notice the difference. It won't be swap it out. Can I hear it or not? Can I hear it or not? Yeah, it, yeah. Will be, it will be night and day. Whether you prefer night yeah, or day is, exactly. is, is up to you. Yeah. <laughs> I've gone yeah. the other way lately. I've I've gone away from path pickups yeah. just because I was getting loads of microphonics, yeah. and it was just frustrating the crap out of me. So um, uh, playing at volume and so sure. close to it, I yeah. was just like, you know what? I actually prefer them to be potted. Yeah. But weirdly, I've gone for slightly hotter sort of paths plus. Yeah. Oh, okay. But with fifties wiring. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So yeah. That, and that suits me. Suits me down to the ground. Who makes your pickups then? Oh, they vary, but I haven't had a bad pair of bare knuckles, so my favourite's yeah, right. a VH2 at the moment. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like a hot path, or the Rebel, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. That's well, the same sketch, really. Yeah. Yeah. If you hear Tim play, and he's a monster yeah. guitar player, and the rock stuff he does, and the Van Halen stuff he does, it's like, oh, man, he understands that sound as well as anyone on the yeah. planet, you know, what it takes to get that going. And his, you know, his stuff for the rock and, and the higher gain stuff is remarkable. The pickups he does for a beer, yeah, far out, man. It's yeah, just yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very groovy. Um, right. Yeah, good luck, Marvin. And uh, we hope you uh, 
enjoy mucking about with that because you if nothing else you'll you'll learn something about what you like and what you like less um marlon romo hello marlon hello, romo marlon. do you use flanger and phaser split wet dry phasers feel better to me going through both amps what are your thoughts i use neither so this is a dang question i so i use flanger wet dry i tend to use phaser pre-drive i actually use both I can use both pre-drive, but uh, flanger I split, or, or I also have after my drive split. Phasers, though, I tend to have pre-drives. I love the way that a phaser sounds into the gain stage. Um, so, I'll, yeah, I'll generally have that going into both amplifiers. But you can, I mean, you, man, you can have, you know, flanger on one side, phaser on the other side. It'd be sound flipping amazing. It'll move. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Don't you feel seasick? <laughs> It'd be, It'd be great. great. I think also, again, as always, volume is a huge part, a huge deal in all of this. Having reminded what it's like to play gigs just recently, I've more gigs in the last few months than I've done in the last couple of years for obvious reasons. It's awesome. Last many years, in fact. And um, I'm, I'm reminded once again that, you know, setting up your sound to sound good in here, even though we play loud, once you do, once you're in that band scenario, assuming you do that, um, everything changes. Everything mm. changes beyond recognition, mm. and I find myself continually wanting to simplify. Sure. And potential paradox upcoming: wet dry is such a better option <laughs> for that because you can dial back your wet without affecting your dry. Yeah. Whereas when you've got it all going through one amp, I just find it gets so confused so quickly. Yeah, you've got to be really on it with that, you know, the difference between 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock yeah. is everything. So for yeah, me, yeah. wet-dry with, with any modulation is cool because I can work out how wet it needs to be sure. and still sit in quite a busy band mix. Yeah. But again, completely different than sat here getting tones week in, week out. Yeah. Michael Corrigan says, please don't forget my second pedal question for Adrian. Oh, did I miss one? Sorry, Michael. Oh, yes. Adrian, if you could only have Michael Corrigan, um, if you could only have two drive pedals on your board, what, would they... what two Thorpeys would they be and what non-two Thorpeys would they be? Oh, blimey. Uh, two Thorpeys, I'd probably I'd go with the Dane and the Warthog. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah, because yeah. Because they can get first boost, drive, yeah, I've got everything in very good. Um, and they work well together. So that's those two sorted. Um, if Two non-Thorpies. Hmm. I would have Kingsley Jester. Nice. For my boost and my drive. Very nice. And I would probably have a differential audio manifestations version of a tone bender. Come on. Nice. Very good. Yeah, those nice. two. <laughs> have you got the new the, the new jester with the impedance control on the input? I don't. Oh, come on. Man. I know, but I, the waiting list is huge, so <laughs> I should message Simon. Um, important question from Dan Bally it says, Thorpey, what do you bench? At the moment, <laughs> but at the moment it's about 140 kilos. I mean, it's been up to 185 kilos. <laughs> Lip and neck, man. So I'm, I was I was working towards 200 kilos. Uh, I got two reps at 185, and then I tore my pec here and I, I didn't but it's it's quite a bad injury when it happens Ugh. and it knocks confidence more than anything else so I, I backed it right back and now i'm working back towards it i want to hit over 200 okay oh my god that's the plan so 440 pounds for our american friends i wonder if we could do one of those world's strongest man that pedal show crossovers <laughs> <laughs> with amps yeah. like like, oh, like the stones we could borrow a tractor yes. trailer and put some 4x12s on the back <laughs> fantastic oh, yeah so, let's see if we launch them <laughs> and the contender from Brackley <laughs> yeah I'd like that it'd be fun <laughs> awesome. I mean, as long as it's not my gear because yeah. it'll get trashed is, um, is Jeff Cape still with us or is he I, I don't want to say no because 
that be if he's alive, if, that'd if, be really bad. If, but, if Jeff Capes is still with us, then we should have him on as guest presenter. If he's not, may he dearly rest in peace. Eddie Hall's the is the is the guy. Oh five five hundred kilo deadlift. Uh, well, I've done over three hundred, and uh, and I can't fathom getting close to five hundred. I don't know how that's doable. Do you, do you do any of that strong man that strong man competition? So I did for a little while. All right, uh, but. I got really I get again it's like confidence because when you get to certain weights yeah, yeah. they're actually really scary yeah I because bet. like and and you know, you watch like the stones I was going to ask you about those stones so if you don't do them right your you, your biceps will tear oh like my not, God. and like Jesus. literally snap here oh. and roll up so you, you what you've got to do this is ego again you've right. got to start really small yeah okay otherwise yeah you, you screw yourself I've got visions of <laughs> it's not great <laughs> People called Magnus pulling Magnus from Magnuson. Yeah, that's yeah, him. That's my childhood hero. Was it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was, yeah. He, was he Swedish or was he Danish? Uh, he was actually Icelandic. Oh, he's Icelandic. Yeah. Here comes the Icelander. <laughs> pulling that vault vault. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like he was on bullseye. Yeah, he was. <laughs> Stepping up to Let's the have a look what you could have won. <laughs> It's a speedball. Oh, it's a speedball. <laughs> Magnus comes in, carrying the speedball. It's a speedball. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jeff uh, Capes is still with us, apparently, oh, Simon JC says. I'm so pleased about that. Go. He's um, a legend. Jeff Capes, Olymp yeah. Olympian as well. Oh, this is, uh, sorry, this... Totally not me better. Memories of a, of a, a British childhood uh, TV programme, I think. That's well, worldwide. Was it? Yeah, yeah. World's well, strongest man. Oh, yeah, worldwide. This was on for a start. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they had a. Uh, oh, it's been an American has won quite a few times. Um, oh. Brian Shaw's won four. Wow. I still follow it. Do you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, a Scott, little... it's a Scots guy who's uh, who's won it won it this year and last year. Uh, the Stoltman brothers. I can never yeah. remember if it's Tom or Luke, but they both they both do it, and he's an advocate for. Um, people with autism because ah, no way aside from the fact he's about seven foot tall and seven foot wide yeah he struggles with autism so he's but he's a real voice for it oh no way so oh, cool. strongest man so presumably that's on that would be on sky or something now would it rather than no, BBC they still one? do it on bloody bbc one at christmas i mean it happened like two months ago and like obviously with the age of the internet it's like who won oh yeah he won oh, okay. oh. but they still hold it till christmas right huh. in the uk anyway they still show it wow What's that guy's name, the Scots guy? Uh, it's either Tom or Luke Stoltman. I, I Stoltman. can't remember which one it is. Nice. They're honoured on the uh, town where they're from. They're on the sign as they go in. <laughs> um, Shawnee is Cubs fan one. He says, I saw Rich Co Richie Cotson last night. Oh, wow. And oh my God, he was incredible. I met him after the show and he was a cool guy. What do you think of his signature amp? Um, I really like it. Yeah. Is that the victory one? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've heard that cranked up to uh, Nam. Yeah, it me was too. amazing. I made the video with Rabir and uh, Martin Kidd when it was launched, and all Victory apps are good. But what I love about that one is it's a single channel, mm. and it goes from lovely clean to really lovely and dirty. And Richie is such a touch player, mm. always on the controls of his guitar, obviously, plays with his fingers and all that. And his dynamic range as a, as a guitar player is vast. And for an amp to be able to deal with that and be really dirty when he wants it and nice and clean when he wants it is a, a fair testament. I think that was a really good uh, hookup, him and, and Martin. And Martin. Yeah. Obviously, Richie uh, played Cornford amps years ago. Um, and there's something about the way Martin voices amps yeah. and the way he approaches game and the way Richie plays it, I think, just dovetail really beautifully. So, um, yeah, I, I, I presume Victory still make it. I don't know, but... Can't be that. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Um, so 2020. Yeah. So yeah. Nice. Um, nice one, Shawnee. Uh, Carl Longbottom is on. Hello, hey, Carl. Carl. Um, evening all. Hope you've had a good holiday. He says, question for Mr. T, which I'm assuming is Mr. Thor. Uh, we had this one before, I think, um, but we'll go for it again. Uh, what's your favourite Thorpey pedal and your favourite from a different manufacturer? Okay. So... So the question was subtly different, I guess, mm. because it was, uh, what would I have on my... My favourite Thorpe pedal, if I had to choose one of them, for sentimental reasons, is probably the Fallout Cloud. Yeah. I think today, anyway. Um, it changes, but for, for sentimental reasons, that's my favourite, I think. I, there is something about the Dane, again, that's, you know, there's a bit of a breakout pedal for us in regard to sort of 
internationally. It yeah. helps break out internationally. The, the, the Dane. Just a quick one on the on the on the Fallout Cloud. Yeah. The very first ever sp- limited edition run of pedals that we ever did on yeah, TPS yeah. was with the Muffroom Cloud. The Muffroom Cloud, which is, which was, preceded the Fallout Cloud. You know, name change for legal reasons. <laughs> um, but. We had it on the show and we absolutely loved it. And that thing into a Marshall with a closed back 4x12. Am I allowed to show it? Yeah, absolutely. I tell you what, that's that's a really, one again, sentimental reasons. This is this is a life lesson for me. Right. And to, to, to sort of swallow the mantra that you get given. But it, it picky battles. And, yeah. you know, sometimes it's all right to lose the battle but win the war, right? Sure. That's a hot saying, but we... We got to send a cease and desist for that name. We could have fought it, but we chose to change the name. Right. Yeah. Because it just, fighting it went against the message we were trying to get yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's all about the pedal. Forget, yeah, yeah. forget the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we changed the name. It doesn't matter. You know, it, it's still the same sound. Um, with regards to other manufacturers' pedals, again, it's, it's Kingsley, uh, but it's, and it's the, either the gesture or the page. Right. Very good. Nice. Hope you're well, Carl. Um, Josh Connett, he says, Hey gents, I just got a PV412 with vintage 30s for $199. Nice. Wow. Uh, an Ego compressor for 50 bucks and a vintage Mesa 112 for 100 bucks. What? Uh, I'm picking it all up today. Is there anything I should look out for um, when I'm buying a 4x12 used? Cone rub. Oh, yeah. It just needs to lit, probably don't crank the out of it to start with gradually increase the volume and listen for cone rub because if it's just been sat there yeah gravity sag yeah, yeah. and all the rest yeah. of it and what would be the telltale signs of cone rub it's like a scraping noise like literally a scraping noise yeah. i mean you can you can get rid of it in some ways if, if it's if it's really minor just flip the speaker one 180 uh, so it drags, it, so it, drags it down and you can get rid of it that way that's like a real quick fix so it it occurs because gravity yeah it's like so many things in life yeah. <laughs> if you <laughs> Miranda Lambert has got a great song called Gravity's a Bitch <laughs> and it's about getting old um, anyway so yeah so it's a physical thing so the speaker sits in one orientation and physically so something drops in it presumably yeah yeah there's a, there's a weight so you you got the is it the armature that goes through it goes through the 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 magnet yeah and it it's it's that bit that scrapes I think okay right. yeah you got the so, two coils together haven't you, you got yeah. the voice coil and you got the the, the magnet it. that goes through and then uh, and that you know that's what gives you when they put put the signal through it the current and starts doing that but the distance have you ever seen a recone kit no. The distance. That's why I've never done a recone. Yeah, it's I like I'm not good enough. At it that. is so tiny, and you've got such a small margin of error. And if that moves, and if anyone's, you know, that rub, if you, um, if you get a speaker that's got it, and you very gently push down on the cone, you'll hear the voice call go, <laughs> and rubbing against so the inside. So that's what it is. And that's okay. what it is. Okay. So. Um, Check your speakers basically. Number one, make sure they all work, and that's easy enough. Just plug it, plug something in very, very, very quietly, and then just put your ear next to each speaker just to make sure each one works. And then listen out for cone rub. Uh, I'd measure the impedance as well. So, put a mm. cable into it, get a multimeter, and measure what that is what it says it is because a lot of the time you get a, what a second hand cab you open it up and it's spaghetti western in there yeah because they've messed with it and it's like oh now it's four ohm and it's supposed to be 16 ohm and obviously yeah. if you're putting the wrong impedance. but don't expect to see the actual impedance yeah, right that's right you're going to yeah. see lower be closer um so if it's a 16 ohm cab it's going to read what 12 13, 13. Yeah, yeah that's right yeah. yeah and if it's an 8 ohm cab lower and if it's a four ohm cab which is very unusual lower so don't expect to see the exact ohm rating but if it says it's a 16 ohm cab and you're reading six that's not that's 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 not really not really working um but yeah just have a listen to the speakers and depending on the speakers don't worry too much about that because if the cabinet is made nicely you know if it's a really nice um ply cab and it's intact and it's working well 
speakers aren't that expensive. Yeah. So if you want to swap out the speakers, I mean, some speakers are really <laughs> expensive, but um, modern Celestians, not, not out of reach. So mm. it might be that even if you do have to replace a couple of speakers, as long as the cab is priced accordingly, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Yeah. And you can have some real fun with mixing speakers in 412s as well. Yeah. Actually, a trick that I learned from a friend of mine in Germany with a 412 cab, that if you want to, you know, play loud in venues with your 4x12, get one of the speakers, make it out of phase. Oh, in the so it cancels. So it cancels. It cancels a little bit, yeah, right? Okay. So you can actually... You know, and everything's still all the, you know, all the impedances are correct and everything. You can turn your amp up a little bit louder. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. And you actually get this strange, not str you know, it sounds, uh, if you imagine you've got three in phase and one out of phase, and this sort of get this bit of a spatial thing happening. It can be a really cool sound. Oh, nice. Interesting. Yeah. Um, it's also worth saying that if you've never had a 412 before, despite all the speaker modelling in the world, despite all the impulse responses, despite all the great sounding closed back 212s, despite all the amazing sounding 1x12s, there is nothing in the world like a 4x12 cab. Indeed. It is a religious experience once it's up there and doing its thing. Jesse Hoff says, Daniel, give Thorpe a kiss from me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jesse. I, I, I love the man as a friend. Yeah. Cheers, man. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As I do you, Jesse. As I do you. <laughs> you beautiful man. Uh, Marvin Box again. He says, um, hi again. Uh, Marvin was asking us before about uh, Is Les Paul. And he says, um, I use a Shanks ODS-1 for my core mm. tone. Do you have any recommendations for gain stacking? That's a Vemuram John Shanks ODS-1, by the way. Uh, I'm thinking of an old boys, uh, old blood noise endeavors fault too, because it's a clone with an EQ. Love you guys in the chat. Um, yeah, it depends what you want to stack with it. That the Shanks ODS one is a wonderfully versatile pedal, super super touch sensitive. Um, if you don't know who John Shanks is, look him up. Uh, I saw him playing with Phil X, um, both him and Phil playing guitar in Bon Jovi. Yes, and uh, really lovely guy. Far out, man, they sound good together, those two. Yeah. He's really definitely great. not the worst guitar player <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Isn't he no. like Emmy, is he Emmy nominated or something like that? He's this? a full like, producer, like, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Like properly awarded. Pretty yeah. serious CV, yeah. I think. Um, so it depends how you run in the ODS-1. If you're running it very gainy, then maybe you want something more boosty. If you're running it more boosty, maybe you want something more gainy. Um, as you will well know, uh, I'm a massive fan of any clon type pedal, mm -hmm. so they tend to work pretty well um, with most things as a boost after. If you can hack the mid-range, because sometimes that mid-range is a bit much for people, a um, bit more vocal. That's yeah. why the old Blood Noise Endeavours one's good, because you've got also, more, more, yeah. more strength in the EQ. Also, the Sick As from Bondi FX yeah. has, has um, uh, a bass control on there as well. It's dare really we, dare we mention the Thorpey Peacekeeper at this point? Indeed. Which can get in that territory too. Yeah. Uh, with similarly adjustable EQ, so. And John yeah. Shanks had one of those for a little while. Oh, did he? In his stage rig, I remember. Do you know you like Instagram stories, stories, stories? He, he was just opening his drawers like that. I was like, yes, <laughs> great. <laughs> uh... <laughs> um, yeah, it's it, it's it, if you'll forgive us, uh, Marvin. It's a it's such a massive question because it really does depend how you're running that yeah. and what you what you want to achieve. Hopefully, some of our. Um, shows on gain stacking and on you know overdrive pedal core types might help you narrow it down a bit actually once you start to ask some very specific questions about things like mid-range response about whether you're looking for an overdrive um more overdrive or more boost it you the, the choices narrow down quite quickly apparently jeff mcphill ends in ah oh, hello jeff hello jeff how lovely hope you're doing well how lovely you got a bunch of legends hanging out Jeff's with us lovely. tonight it is. It's, it's always surprising. Yep. Uh, Josh Connett again. More more about 412s. He says, I can't wait to enter the world of 412s. This is my first... This is my first. Any tips for a first-time 412 owner in terms of how to EQ and set my pedals uh, generally in comparison to when using a 112 or a 212? Uh, just embrace yeah. the glory that is the 412. Uh, it is... More low-end. 
Yeah, but it's a different low end, right? It's a t it's a tighter yeah. thing. Yeah. In, 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 yeah. Bec so thing with the, the 412, and it's a closed back thing as well. It's a vacuum, not a, not a perfect vacuum, but it's a vacuum. So when you hit a chord, right, the speakers push forward, but they are pushing forward in more of a vacuum situation that takes more energy for the speakers to push forward. As it does in an open back cabinet, it can move freely. And that set, and that's a different response. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there is nothing. I mean, I don't know what amp you're using, but have you ever set up two two by two by uh, four four by twelve four four by twelve? I have never done that. We should try and do that. Okay. I'd love just to experience it. Once. I still want to do amp henge. Where were we? We were <laughs> we we were in Germany, and we 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 were talking. I, we might have been talking with Phil X, or it might have been Pete Thorne or somebody. There was a load of us in Germany, and we were talking about it was pete thorne actually and um the idea was to create basically create stonehenge and stand in the middle of it with an amp switcher and turn stuff on and off and and record it and just basically have i don't know what it would be 10 <laughs> oh that would be amazing <laughs> oh can Whoa. we do that <laughs> with headphones yeah <laughs> yeah right, <laughs> right. <laughs> like, that pedal show becomes deaf yeah because on braille what P pedals <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when we were at Nam, they, they had a, uh, they had, oh, I'm going to get this wrong again because this is really embarrassing. Chris Book took the Mickey out of me for this. It's uh, who just sing this cheer up sleepy Jean? Uh, you know the song. Uh, uh, the monkeys? No. No, no. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I've got that wrong as well. Anyway, there was a. Was a believer. It was a plexi, and I said, oh, it's Neil Diamond. Isn't Neil Diamond? No. no, not Neil Diamond. It's. Um, Anyway, terribly, I said, oh, yeah, we heard this plexi all cranked up. And for for whatever reason, I goes, oh, yeah, it was Neil Diamond's amp. And, and it, it, obviously it wasn't. And, uh, <laughs> it was it Neil Sean or somebody? Or... No, this is really, this is even more embarrassing because yes. now I can't remember. Get Chris Book on, he'll, he'll know. Uh, Chris, he took them, if you know who it was, <laughs> someone else Diamond. He mocks me. Um, Anyone uh, else called Diamond? Not Neil Sadaka. No, no, no. Anyway, is somebody in Anthrax it's called Diamond? It's thoroughly embarrassing because he cranked this amp up and, uh, and I was like, oh, yeah, Neil Diamond's. He goes, no, no, it's not Neil Diamond. <laughs> yeah. Sounds loud, though. Four, it's four by, two four by twelves with a plexi on. That's it's amazing. Visceral. I would love to do that. I'm I'd love to, to do it. who... Yeah, anyway. Uh... Yeah, just plug it in, Josh. Plug it in. Written by Neil Diamond, but Monkeys had the hit. There you go. So I said it. Go. Yeah. So I said it was Neil Diamond. It wasn't Neil Diamond. Uh, oh, this is going to bug me. But anyway, I'll sit here amusing how embarrassed I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's absolutely terrible as well. When it, it's, it's like it's like Chris Rea type person. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Gibson A O One, for that. That's great. Uh, <laughs> Far out, Neil. I, I might tell my Neil Diamond story, but it's um, man, he wrote some songs. He wrote so many songs for lo like loads of people. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I always do "Sweet Caroline" at a, a, a solo gig. Right. If people don't sing to "Sweet Caroline," they're dead. There's not a person on the planet that won't at least hum along to "Sweet Caroline." Good times never. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I realised how much I enjoy the show while you were gone, says Jim B. Thank you for what you do. What are your thoughts on Pal Ferro fingerboards? Fender stopped using Rosewood in 2017 mm. on some of the Mexican Ensenada guitars. What do we think of Pal Ferro? It's better for the environment. That's a nice thing, isn't it? Also known as Rio Rosewood, it was also the fingerboard wood on the Fender Stevie Ray Vaughan signature strap. There you go. Really? Yeah. Okay. Me and Danish Pete did a comparison on Andertons years ago uh, when they started doing it, and we couldn't really hear any difference. We got two identical strats. It looks different. Mm. And that's the thing, isn't it? The Visually, well, that stuff is important. You You expect to hear something different. I think it's like one of the reasons that... Um, Monty's Monty Presso is so popular 
because people love having a dark fingerboard. Well, they can, you know, they can make their palfero darker. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I would much rather have that than I, I bought a a Martin years ago, a cheaper Martin, and had a composite material for the fingerboard. Oh, that's and it, it's like. Uh, what was it called? It was called... I can't remember. I've been to the factory and watched them putting it on. Um, anyway, I never got on with that. How, however, um, Jesse has the same guitar. Jesse Hoff. We bought, I bought the guitar after seeing his. Uh, it's an old... It, well, I say it's old. You know, it's, it's, it's a Martin that we were both gigging at the time. And he loves that guitar. It may, it, it's, it's a great sound thing I just never got on with mine and because whenever I played the fingerboard it's like no matter how many gigs I did on it it just always felt new rich light uh, okay rich light right. rich light they call yeah right yeah so I had a composite I, I, one on a Vigier and that was nice yeah right I, I liked it it was very glassy rich light yeah yeah there you go That's I didn't mind it. I, it it was sort of hard like ebony I thought but right that, again could have been a visual thing yeah um, so I've just had a rosewood fingerboard darkened by Hugh Price Oh, nice! He did a load of work for me on this on this Tokai I had, and uh, he used apparently ammonia darkens up wood. Who'd have so thought? So ammonia vapor. It's a it's a furniture trick. Because you think it would be a bleach. Yeah, so that makes sense though, because the sweat from your fingers is uric acid, yeah. which is ammonia. It's got yeah. ammonia in it. So over time, vintage guitars will get darker. Interesting. Interesting. So yeah. they probably weren't as dark when they were new. Even yeah. though everyone goes, oh, it's Brazilian, brass board, whatever. Probably wasn't that dark anyway. No, well, it's funny. If you look at some um, Brazilian rosewood acoustic guitars, they can be amazingly figured. Yeah. And almost chocolate yeah. colour. Like red stripes. Tinges. Yeah, 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 right. Um, yeah, light chocolate, obviously, not dark chocolate. Um, <laughs> so it does... It's got caramel it, I mean, the Indian rosewood tended to be darker. It's, a lot of Indian rosewood's very dark. Yeah. But... Well, they still... So... Oh, case in point, look. Blue's got one of the darkest fingerboards on a strat I've seen in years, and that's Indian. Right. See, let's have a look at the grain. But presumably, that's Indian as well. Yeah. I would imagine they're both Indian. Yeah. See that stripe going through there? Yeah, yeah, the red. You see that? I would say that's Indian because it's less. But... Yeah. Yeah. Don't know if you can really detect that from what's going on but blue's got a very very dark fingerboard and my custom shop strap not so much um and then here's a piece of brazilian rosewood right yeah if you were to choose you'd probably probably choose that way yeah. mm. but if you look at the grain i think that's tire isn't it yeah yeah okay there you go. so yeah. yeah um but what do we think about pal Ferro? um Oh, yeah, I, I can't say I've yeah, that's nice. noticed any that's massive nice tone too, difference, but then, I don't know, I just don't know. It's like soup, isn't it? I don't think it matters, does it? Uh, yeah, it's visual for most people, isn't it? Brian Mills says, pre-fret sprout, super 80s band. Very good. <laughs> I like ebony best. You do? You're an ebony Yeah, uh, just for, for the darkness and yeah. the tininess, but I like what Taylor did with buying the ebony forests or some. Yeah. And then dictate him which so because people were throwing away a lot of the ebony because it because had they figure. yeah so they'll yeah. use the figured pieces as well yeah, yeah. I, th I, I think that looks fantastic yeah. so once you're forced to re-educate yourself and go that's the way that is better for us yep so when i was getting my acoustic guitar built uh johnny kincaid had all of this ebony and some of it had these amazing light colored patterns through it and he says, well, it's all still ebony. Yeah. He said, but they didn't, they threw away this stuff for the longest time because they had assumed that people just wanted the dark stuff. So naturally, you know, I'm buying up, you know, ebony now that's got this beautiful figures and stuff through it. It's like some of it looks absolutely amazing. Um, and he gives customers the option of, you know, having that those fingerboards. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for everyone who said Rich Light. Uh, Tim Lurch again, um, Lellenberg. Uh, Rees van der Stern, um, Henning Hesse, uh, all reminding us that it's called Rich Light. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 uh. And uh, William Engler wants to pick you up on a point. He says uh, deaf people don't use Braille. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Well, they might be blind and deaf. There we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah, that's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go and eat my face. Um, <laughs> what the? <laughs> it's a long day. Completely right. passed me by. <laughs> that was great. Oh, God. I'll never live it down. Moving I on. I don't care. Um, Jordan uh, Kosisko. Jordan Kosisko wants to know. He says, um, Hi, dear Nam. I'm a long time fan. First time super chatter. Well, thank oh, you, thank you that, buddy. Jordan. He says, I run a Vox AC15 with a Fender Princeton. Oh, come on. Uh, black and blue, as he calls them. Um, a 15 watt and a 12 watt Alnico blue speaker. Beautiful. Uh, in wet dry. Which amp would you run wet? Much love from Pittsburgh. So, they'll both work great in wet. It all depends on. Um, so, okay. My wet amp is my matchless, but that is on 15 watts, it's on half power. My dry amp is my Lazy J J20, and that's a 22 watt amp, or a 20 watt amp. But I prefer the feel of the uh, Lazy J sort of turned up and a little bit of attenuation on there. So it's got this beautiful grind and, and because of my rig, I can sort of point different overdrives at that and then other stuff through to the matchless. It all depends on when you're doing your gain staging, what amp you prefer, you know, without any of the wet stuff on. If there's an amp that you turn up a little bit, uh, not necessarily turn up a little bit, but but the, so as gain staging is concerned, if there's an amp that you like the sound of it limiting a bit more, um, then, you know, use that as a, as a dry amp. But they, both will work. My only question is, is the Princeton that you've got, because you mentioned the speakers, was the Princeton that you've got a 10 inch or a 12 inch? That's exactly what if I was going to say. If it's a 10 inch speaker, use the Princeton as the dry amp yep. and use the uh, Fox as the wet amp. Yeah, so the, the, the in the Princeton, it's not true of all 10 inch speakers, but in the Princeton's specifically you do get this very interesting mid-range focus mm. and i think what dan's uh, galloping towards there is that you'll probably get more bass and treble extension out of the 12 it's also a slightly bigger cab the ac15 yeah so you'll probably get slightly uh, better and let's say there is no better there's only different but wider frequency response from your delays and reverbs and the wet stuff they'll sound that bit, bit bigger in the 12 inch speaker and the bigger cab boom which may uh, lead to a higher fidelity experience. If you want the opposite of that, swap them around. Chris Turner says, Tim Lurch is on here? Well, now I feel like I have to go practice my harmony. <laughs> Mate, absolutely. We I, all have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I had a lesson from Tim a little while ago, and I'm still working on all the stuff that he's given me. I'll be working on that for the rest of my life. You know, it's, it's, and, you know anyone that doesn't know Tim Lurch, go and check out some of his stuff on YouTube. Astonishing jazz guitar player. But it's like, some nights we do just sit here in disbelief who sort of joins us for these chats. It's really wonderful. I, I'm just wondering if, if, if Tim uh, and I want to say players like Tim, there are no players like Tim. I wonder if, if you object to the term jazz guitar player, Tim, I wonder if, if you just consider yourself guitar player. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, the only reason I use that as a term for someone who can play jazz. Well, not only can play jazz, but <laughs> has the most astonishing uh, harmony vocabulary mm. that I hear more in jazz. The way that, um, you know, and I've got, gone through Tim's latest book and it's this amazing uh, chord bible um, and this approach to uh, chord solos and, you know, mm. playing melodies and stuff within chords. And that's something that I hear a lot in jazz and I just you know yeah I love Tim jazz yeah it's, I, I think what it what goes on in my head there is a sort of internal cul-de-sac or a paradox because the more the more harmonically aware you become mm. the more it becomes music it's just me absolutely and and that's why I think like if you say blues guitar player yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. country guitar player maybe it, the the especially with blues in my case anyway sure the 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 demarcation fits because it is necessarily narrower Okay. But with jazz, 
it is music. It is. It's all music. Isn't well, it? and but just saying jazz that yeah, is yeah. so broad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I tell you what, when um, Andy Timmons was staying with us for the, you know, we're doing the, the gigs with Andy, yeah. and uh, we had joint custody. Um, and he would stay at me for a couple of days with, <laughs> with Nick. But I, you know, Andy's staying at my house. Of course, I'm going to grab a guitar and go, just show me this thing, you know. And we sat down and we just went through some harmony. And I tell you what, man, that the stuff that he knows and he can, like the jazz that he can play is just flipping awesome. But what he does is he just, he takes out the melodic parts because he is all melody. And he just takes out the bits of that harmony that connect with him and he uses that. But he's never going to say, check out my jazz chops. You know what I mean? Just it's like just vocabulary. like it's just like mm -hmm. it just adds to what he wants to say. Well, Tim's come back and he said, "I don't mind the word jazz, but it's a bit narrow for what I do. Sure. When I play, I don't have a word in my mind. There you I love go. That. I there love you that. Go. Thank Beautiful. you for that, Tim. Thank you, um, Adrian. Um, Pedal boards of doom. Say hi. Oh, hello. Ah. Um, and Gordon Rankin. Do you know Gordon? The name is familiar. Yeah. Um, we, we've become acquainted, Gordon and us. And uh, Gordon is a really seriously good designer of things yeah uh has extensive knowledge anyway of lots of things and designs lots of really amazing things anyway he says sorry i'm late adrian i put a peacekeeper on my board and i love it thank you ah thank you very much yeah, Gordon. very good um and oh yeah jordan uh Cosisco came back and said the princeton actually does have a 12 inch arnico plu um gordon corrected me to say uh most 10 inch speakers have a higher um uh, treble peak than a 12 inch right so 10 inch speakers more more treble peak apparently um, anyway let's move along uh, did you hear any of um, uh, 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 country boy Albert Lee Albert Lee did you hear any of the stuff that he did with Amy Lou Harris when mm. he was playing through uh, Music Man the Music Man the 10 inch Mm. There's like a very different sound than a, you know. But anyway, you know, I loved you... that that sound that he had with that. I just okay. flip and loved that. Nice. My mum once said to me, "If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all." So I'll go on to the next question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> lost in the code. <laughs> Would you do a show about using post speaker effects in a live situation? Dan, you have an ISO cab. Like a Leslie? I think... Does that count? Because that is the speaker. I think he might mean like front of house. So, you know, in the way they used to do... Wet, um, like reverb on the... They we used to take the feed take off the speaker, speaker off and, the, and, then and then run it through stuff. And the then, reverbs uh, and delays okay. after the speaker. Like in a, you know, in a music production sense. I think most of that would come down to front of house now, wouldn't it? That, mm. that would... Who would be controlling all of that but i guess you could do it you could you could control all of that yourself yeah it's quite niche yeah but i think i mean loads of players used to do it. i think um right remember in the early or mid 90s when i saw alan holdsworth in sydney and he was something very similar he had his boogies on stage but then running a tap from that into a mixing desk and mixing his own effects through stuff on stage as well. Wow. Um, oh man, that's a gig I'll never forget. I remember I just stood at the front for 10 minutes and then I just had to stop and go to the bar and <laughs> get a drink and just sort of, it's like, he has it said, have a break now. Yeah. Go and have a drink and then come back. Apparently Larry Carton used to do that yeah. most. Um, we know that, that that Landau did it. We know that Luca probably did it. We know that mm -hmm. in, like a lot of those that era of guitar players who did loads of sessions did it. And I guess in a live environment, that's probably how it was largely always done because the if the delays and the reverbs would be in the front of house. Uh, okay, I just sure. have visions of Led Zeppelin and them Sister. swinging that cab 
around <laughs> to, and then and then having the mic or was it the I saw the cab I think it was the cab they were swinging the cab around in this hallway well we have to do it now <laughs> right and then obviously miking it up in the room and getting different sounds from where the speaker was Dan Coggins was telling me about it. he's like an encyclopedia on this stuff and Queen did that as well yeah. in the studio they were yeah. Let's get more Well, maybe that's what we could do in Studio One at Abbey Road then. <laughs> Just put go a mic in the middle caps. and swing a phone. <laughs> we've we've reinvented the rotating speaker. Yeah, they appear pretty pretty good, like a hammer thrower. I'll come along. <laughs> yes. I'll give it a go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So you send the corner oh, with it. Be the counterweight. Right. <laughs> be spin. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> What's that? It's my big Leslie. <laughs> we we'll take uh, him everywhere with us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, right. Um, Steve Salazar. Hey, Steve. He says, um, I'd, we use a tap into the head speaker line with the Groove Tube speaker emulator for post effects when those came out. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, uh, that's it. You've got to find a way of tapping between what comes out of the amp and the speaker. Uh, if you want to do it that way, or you're talking about post speaker effects, so you're mic in the speaker, or you're going direct in some way, and then you're adding the effects after. I mean, that's just that's post production, isn't it? That's. I guess you could get into having a mixer like Larry used to do. Um, I think what he used to do was mic the amp, feed that into a mixer, and then have a pair of JBLs, mm. you know, four inch flat response PA speakers, basically for his for his wet effects. It's like a produced guitar sound in yeah. a live environment. Yeah, totally. Yeah, wow. I think that might even be too complex for us. Yeah. Never seen that. No, worth a go. Yeah. Um, Sam Webster. Thoughts on if on the effect of the guitar player. Player corpulence. I don't know what corpulence means. Oh, he's talking about how fat you are. Ah. As in, does the belly affect sustain? It's exactly what he's talking about. Yeah. I've never heard that word before. Corpulence. It's a polite way of saying someone's rotund. Ah. Big That's another word. Yeah. That's worth. <laughs> he's talking yeah. about me. That's so rude. Yeah. That's the... Mumsy, they used to say about some girls, didn't they? They're very mumsy. <laughs> Is that the strongest man in the world? They have the, the power the, belly. The corpulence division. <laughs> <laughs> So, exactly. Sam says, would a guitar against a firm tummy, in theory, yield an incrementally brighter tone or more sustain than where a soft one would dampen? So, it, there's another effect here, and I, he doesn't mention it, but you've got to bring it in. Like, your fingers are going to be fatter. Yeah. So That's a so, thing, so, so dude. You're, so, your fretting is going to be a little bit softer. It's like having a compressor on. Yeah. And you won't be able to do it as well. I, honestly, I think one of the reasons I struggle um, with with how do i say this i remember hearing edgar winter you don't like no, guitar no no players, i remember i know i remember hearing john uh, johnny johnny winter playing guitar thinking how does he get such great tone with such skinny fingers it is rare that i hear a guy that with rarer oh, how do i say this you when prefer I, thin guitar players. No, no, I pref the prefer sound of, the sound of sound of guys with big hands. Right. There's a sound they have. That yeah, there's something in that. There is something in that. But then I I also know a few guitar players with small hands, and they put their they they put a lot of their style and um, lack of confidence down to their small hands. And I know plenty of guitar players with small hands who also sound great. Okay. We're not talking about penises, Daniel. That's, that's not part of this discussion. So anyway, does the belly affect it? Yeah, yeah. I think... So if it's out here and you're... Hang on! There is a, a semi-serious question in there somewhere. Particularly if you play a guitar such as this. It's got a belly cut in it. Oh, right, OK. Oh, yeah, right. All right, this is related to that, but I swear... There was a few guitarists who got their pubes. They were playing naked and <laughs> got stuck in the in the springs when they did a dive. <laughs> Some chili peppers. <laughs> Just listen to the reverb. Office. Swang. Um. Yeah. Now, if that's flat and dead against your um, corpulence, it's like having a sponge yeah. behind the springs. You're going yeah. to deaden the springs, so it will have an effect. You won't get it stuck in it. Okay. 
Yeah, there you go. And I don't care what anyone says, you can totally hear that through the pickups. Totally. So, yes. So what you're saying is you need you need a six pack abs to to let your springs ring out. <laughs> or oh, a hollow place. belly. Yeah. So, so the springs are in a cave. Let's a... let's let the comment section go wild then. I went and saw Papa Chubby play in Germany many years ago. Flying V, no springs there. And was he playing a, I don't think he was playing a flying what V. That, what's his name? Papa, Papa Chubby. Chubby. Embraced. I like and it. <laughs> Uh, he's a, he's a, a rotund gentleman with with corpulence at the yin yang. He sounded <laughs> flippin' heck, man. That guy sounded amazing. Okay, amazing. Uh, straw poll then. Are fat or thin guitar players better? Uh, please, <laughs> please argue it in the comments section with examples if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> I, I think in America people are, don't like the word fat. We use it with uh, with. We use it happily here in the UK, so if you're, apolog- if you're offended by that, please Oh, yes, because you have to call the fat controller Mr. Topham Hat now, don't you? Oh, I just call him fat, I'm afraid. <laughs> and also, it's, we're missing one of the Beatles out of the narration, you know. <laughs> yeah, where's he gone? He was brilliant on the Thomas Tank Engine. Yeah, Ringo. Here comes Percy. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really creepy. <laughs> Get it stuck in, get Percy stuck in the springs. The good news is we're almost finished. Um, <laughs> Albus Band, hello Aaron. He says, uh, oh, we've got a bigger dressing room than the puppets. That's refreshing. Welcome back, welcome back. Uh, if you played a different instrument, what would it be? I'd have done the drums. Bashing skins would have ruled. Oh, keyboard. Keyboard. Because Jack Duxbury. Oh, uh, man. Uh, I keep seeing him playing. I think he looks so freaking cool. He's unbelievable. I want to do that, and I like to the point where I've toyed with buying a keyboard, you know, just to look good in the room and get dusty because you haven't know, mm. got much time. I got one of those a couple of years ago. Did it look good and dusty? It's very dusty. Yeah. Nice. I'd like that if I could. If I could instantly have his talent, yeah, I'd be in. He, Dan? Was, he was incredible. No guitar. What other instrument? I'd love to play piano. I piano. would. Piano. It's it's my. I don't have many regrets in life, but that is a massive one. It doesn't um, have to be a regret. Yeah, not dead yet. No, I know. I'm still. I'm trying to get this thing. I'm working really hard on this, and it's and, and my gains are slow. So, but I, I definitely would love to. My favorite guitar players are all keyboard players as well. So you have to be efficient and get a keytar. Combine oh, the two. Man, How cool would that look? That's a, a git board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fast forward to TPS 2031. Down on his DX77. <laughs> Actually, the 77 already exists. The 777. That keytar show. Oh, yeah, brilliant. We're giving it the full-on down hammer. <laughs> Why haven't they invented a git board that's got a little theremin thing that pops up? They must have done. Have they done that yet? Yeah. I haven't seen one. They must have done. Yeah. Theremins are strange. They are weird. I think it's because anyone who's lame enough to play a git board is not cool enough to use a theremin. Tim Lurch says, lap piano. Yeah. I like it. Is that, uh, was that divisive enough comment? Uh, drums without a shadow of any doubt in the whole world. Apart from the... Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I love drums. I tried it a few times. I, I just... It, like a I'm octopus hopeless. that's having a fit. Yeah, yeah. Utterly it didn't work. Yeah. I do love drums. I love drums. Same as you... Uh, Aaron. Uh, Victor Gustafsson, welcome back, Toenails. Have a pint on me. Ah, Thank you, Victor. That's very kind of you. Uh, Tree O Life. Tree O Life. Do you have any ethical thoughts about buying used gear when the new version is available? Um, I think Thorpey would very much like you to buy new gear. (sighs) That's tricky, isn't it? You've You've got to buy what you can afford. If you... There's an element of... If you only ever buy used gear and you could afford the new gear, then ultimately whoever's whoever's the manufacturer might not be able to no. make the new thing yeah. if they're not supported. Yeah. So at some point, if you like the manufacturer, support them by buying the new thing, you mm-hmm. know. But if you don't have the budget for that, buy it used, you know. Mm. You know, I've, we've we've helped a lot of customers buy used Thorpey stuff, 
and I've never regretted it because ultimately it ends up being a bit of a gateway drug and yeah that's a good point you know and they ultimately we, yeah. we've got customers for life I bought this used and now I've bought yeah X. it's a good way in yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes it's too much of a step to go all in for the new item. Yeah. This is interesting. Lost in Code says used gear is rarely cheaper now. That's, yeah, really yeah, interesting. Well. The one thing, so the thing about used gear is if you are, if you just want to try something and you don't know if you're going to like it and you buy one used and you don't like it, then there's a good chance that you'll get most, if not all, of your money back on it. Yeah, I like know? that. Rather than sending it back to a shop where then, someone's uh, had to swallow that loss. Yeah. Now you you know if you buy it off off the Bay of Dreams and and you know you know things there are you know fees and you've got to negotiate all that stuff. However, um, you know when I was buying loads of you know like vintage stuff, obviously you've got to get you've got to buy you know, used. Buy, buy it used. But I think. Um, you know, it also depends. There's, there's, for me, there's a vast chasm between a manufacturer like yourself that is designing these, you know, amazing, you know, handmade circuits with love, and or something that's come from a a how do I say this? Cost-effective Far East man manufacturer. Go. Yeah, I was about go. to make the same point. Yeah, there is. There's, there's the opposite ethical point, which you may well have just been talking about while I was reading the comments. Um, you know, there's no doubt that there is a surfeit of of cheaply produced goods in the world that is not good for many, many things. It's good for making some people extremely rich, but it's perhaps not so good environmentally and maybe not so good ethically on, on many levels in terms of the way and where it's manufactured, etc. So um, I think it's a personal decision, isn't it? I like yeah. to buy from people yeah. that I like. Yeah, yeah. I, absolutely. That's it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. I think so we take something like the camouflage. I would like to reiterate that it is a personal decision. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But so some someone like the camouflage, which is something that we were talking about for years and Dan Coggins and stuff, you know, and, and I remember um uh years ago Dan bought in a prototype. It was like it was breadboard. And, and yeah, yeah, and it's like, what do you think of this? And I plugged it in and just went, Oh put it in a box. I'll have it. <laughs> and it was the start of the idea that between you and Dan became the camouflage. Yeah. And it's like, and I, I love that. I love the, um, you, know, you know, knowing you guys is obviously a big thing, but I know the work and the passion and the commitment that goes to getting those things out the door. Yeah. And that's a big deal to me, yeah, yeah. you know. And as, you know, and I think one of the reasons that uh, things like having your face on and one of the things we talked about early doors as well and something that you weren't sure if you were going to be comfortable with yeah. was actually being having your face out there and I was like actually no I, it's it's so important yeah. that people get to uh, see and appreciate the passion and work that goes into it and you know it's you said it, didn't you? People buy from people. People buy from people. Yeah, again, that's a lesson I had to learn. Yeah. And it was it was yourself, actually, uh, who directed me that way. Because I, I did want to hide a little bit. Yeah. I main, mainly because I was, one, still serving at the time, mm. and and two, wasn't that comfortable. And I, you know, yeah. I still find it awkward. I get, for some reason, I always get the nervous sweats when I'm on camera. Like, I'm not hot. I just really... And I'm not nervous. I just... Body goes... Yeah, here you go. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I wasn't comfortable. Also, because I make gaffs like blind people <laughs> use braille. Sorry, <laughs> deaf people use braille. Oh, yeah, brilliant. Um, so no, I think it's, it's psychology, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. People buy from people. If you like their story, you like what they're doing. But it, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, There's so many wonderful people in this industry, and agreed. you know, it's it's such an interesting. Uh, the creativity, it's like for me, it's a marriage of all the most amazing things, be it the, the creativity, the, you know, engineering, the art, you know, the the player behind it, you know, uh, Simon Jack's a great example. We get him on the show. We love his pedals and we love the stuff that goes into it. We just get him on the show to hear him play guitar. I don't blame you. You know? Um, <laughs> it, so, and we get 
and he's you know he's a beautiful guy and there's so many people in this industry that yeah we love because of that you know it's yeah it's wonderful yeah, it's a shared passion isn't it yeah david pekarski says um i bought a muffin cloud used ended up with a veteran a peacekeeper a boneyard and a camouflage there you go awesome, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> thank you very much honestly yeah. that, that, that's amazing yeah yeah. Awesome, they, man. Thank you. Yeah, it's, that was a genuine smile. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're not here very often. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Good morning, Tibia Tidbids, says Sean Patrick Watkins. Very good. Great show with Mick, with the refret. There's something the beautiful. <laughs> There's something beautiful about that kind of methodical hands-on craftsmanship. Uh, good to see you both back. Cheers, Sir Sean Patrick Watkins. Oh, cheers, mate. It's an amazing video. It's, it's an amazing. extension of what Dan just said. The the connection of, of passion with craft, with music. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it is a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's something that we we take seriously. And we, you know, also, if you think of the community that's sort of built up around this, um, even just the, the TPS community, um, it's a lot to have in common. With yeah. someone if you're into this stuff i get on the phone to dan coggins and i can talk to that guy for hours yeah you know what i mean because i mean his knowledge of music is unbelievable but his knowledge of the process and the of how they made the music and how they made those sounds and it's like i can't understand how anyone in the world would listen to that and not be absolutely enthralled so you know he, what i mean yes yeah, so i've my father-in-law's got a book on the Beatles and it's a limited edition thing. It's about this thing and it's all about Abbey Road and how they recorded, right? Mm. This thing is worth a fortune now uh, to buy. And I, and I thumbed through it. I was like, oh, but yeah, that's how they did that. That's how they did that. I told Dan, was, oh yeah, yeah. And then also, <laughs> da -da 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 -da. you're like, what? How yeah, do you yeah, know yeah. this stuff? Yeah, it's amazing. And he's like, oh, because yeah, yeah. that's, that's my passion, you know? He, yeah. he loves vinyl. Although he got a bit funny because I bought a record player, a nice one. I said, is it wrong to buy... Slipknot on vinyl and have that the first thing I listen to. And for me, it's not wrong. He was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Should be the Beatles. Oh, oh very good. <laughs> it would be great to get Andy and him in a room. Andy Timmons, his Beatles knowledge is like, Bonkers. It'd be like top trumps. I'm yeah. like, no, no joke. We should do it. Film it. <laughs> I told you that I, go. I, I had, be amazing. Uh, I, Road, go. I had dinner with, with Andy and Dave Gregory after that, um, when Andy played, uh, down at Guildford. Yeah. And I went and had a curry with them and I, I just stood there. I, like I was eating and I just didn't say a word. I didn't want to, I didn't want anything that I said to interrupt this unbelievable conversation that was happening, you know, around the Beatles and all the stuff. Yeah. What, so I know a handful of guys like that, you know, Dan Coggins included. And it is like, a, how do you retain that information? I have no idea. It's incredible. I feel like a child. Yeah, yeah, by yeah, the way, yeah, yeah. When I'm in these conversations, I feel like I'm going to say something stupid yeah. and irrelevant, <laughs> which I invariably do. Yeah, I'd be right there with you on that. Okay, uh, welcome back. Pizza on me, says Mojo. Thank you. Oh, bless you, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's very kind of you. And the last question from Al Gorham tonight. Hey, Al. Uh, he says, fellas, I'm getting in early. <laughs> well, sorry, we turned the Super Chats off at the beginning. Uh, no question, just a massive thank you to you and Adrian. Welcome back. Hope the holes were great. Uh, God, I love the Boneyard. Thank oh. you. Ah, oh, yeah, man. Yeah, awesome. Um, Steve Salazar was also asking, did he miss anything about Thorpe Effects? Were we talking specifically about Thorpe Effects? We talked a little bit, but not a huge amount. Um, so there might have been some stuff earlier on. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we talked a bit, but we just, you know. We're just shooting the breeze. Oh, it's good though. Yeah. Chatting the stuff. Less of the hard sell. <laughs> uh, sorry, just uh, yeah. Oh well, we'll finish on a specific question then from Zoot Allure. Hello, Zoot. That's he cool. says, Adrian, I love my Fallout Cloud. When I have all the controls at twelve new noon, the Unity volume level is about seven or eight o'clock. Is this normal? Okay, so it's very loud for him. Yeah, so it is normal. And the reason is we changed one thing on the Fallout Cloud over and above. It was the ergonomics. When we first released it as the Muffroom Cloud, we're back to that. People don't want to use the controls fully. And they, um, with all our pedals, 
we really want you to use all of the yeah. range of the control because we've yeah, yeah. done it like that for a reason, right? Yeah. You might get some rubbish sounds out of the very extremes, but unlikely. Yeah. So the volume when on the Muffroom Cloud was further round, and it had it had an A taper pot in it, so it was logarithmic, and it was masses of volume bunched at right. one end. Right. That was fine for certain people because the active treble and bass also adds 6 dB or takes it away. Mm -hmm. yeah. What we did was we changed the volume taper to linear B and the uh, the reason is so that no matter where you are with your bass and treble uh, selection, you've got more than enough volume already. Yeah. I mean, for some people, Unity is around about, like say, seven and nine. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Just take it all the way off it doesn't matter we've baked it in that way and it was yeah. an ergonomics thing some people don't like it some people do but we think for the majority of people it works better because yeah. of where you change the bass and the treble frequencies yeah so an, an interactivity thing yeah, yeah it's funny that isn't it there's so much psychological stuff involved with where i i definitely used to do it where mm. I, I would never try the controls at zero and at ten I'd always stick them somewhere in the middle and assume that that would be the right place to have yeah. them. If it really bugs you, set it to where you like it. Take, take your off. Allen key, take the knob off and put it in the moon, <laughs> put it back on, bingo. Uh, that's the answer. There you go. Psychologically there you go. fixed. There you go. <laughs> cool. That will be us for today. Um, Thorpey, thank you so much for joining us. Thank it's been you for awesome, bud. Thank you so no, much. It's been um, great. It was it was a chance thing. He was in the area and he um, came to visit. And we said, "Would you like to join us for VCQ?" So uh, for those of you who wanted more Thorpey content, apologies we didn't get too much into that, but yeah. uh, I think there was a, a, a happy helping of Thorpey Indeed. content. Indeed. That was some really embarrassing uh, moments. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> don't, don't At least it's filmed and you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we'll be out there. That's great. Are you joining us for Meat Feast? Yeah, absolutely. Oh come on. Yeah, yeah. Um, Oh, maybe I did miss just a few, actually. Yes, sorry, there are a couple more. Uh, literally two more. Okay. Um, Dan Sokolowski says, I've never played a Thorpey pedal. Which one or two should I start with? Always love the show. Welcome back and hi to Adrian. Can I make a suggestion? And then you can say one and then you can say one. Yeah. Uh, the, I find the Dane is a really great starting point for Thorpey pedals because it for me it's it's the one um even in extreme positions it'll work with with anything we've got yeah, here yeah, you know yeah. what i mean and also because that boost is so flipping fantastic um so i i think as an as an introduction to Thorpey pedals is great from you know and from there depending on you know amps and stuff you know Warthog, obviously, we love, but the heavy water, you know, again, if you're looking for a boost pedal, it's one boost pedal that we put on the board, and it was like turned around, and we were just both looking at each other going, smiling. Oh my God, it's yeah. amazing. Or you could dive straight into the pulse doppler. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a lot yeah. more uh, yeah. tricky. Yeah, it's a, there's a lot baked in there. I mean, I, I, I'd say Fallout Cloud, if you, so even if you're not into Fallout Cloud's good because. If you're not, even if you're not into fuzz, per mm. se, that is both a good introduction to fuzz. Yeah, yeah. Because it's 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 easy to play. Mm -hmm. More you get more violin light sustain out of that than you would some of the more esoteric type fuzzers. Sure. And it's and it and it doesn't matter where it sits on your board. And you can tune it because of the EQ. So yeah. powerful, you can tune it in. Yeah, that's a good shot. Um, or if you want an overdrive that can pretty much cover most bases, and aside from the Dane, probably the Peacekeeper. Peacekeeper. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Finally, Clive. Hello, Clive. It was nice to meet you the other night in uh, Essex there. He says, great seeing Mick the other week at the Atlantic Junction gear. Great show. Thanks for all the help you both keep giving us. Thank you and keep up the good work. Oh, lovely. Um, it was nice to meet you, Clive. Thanks for coming out to the show. So Mick has done a, a number of gigs recently, but he he one of the gigs he did was with um, Neville Martin uh, for Neville's album yeah it's just, no he's well past the launch stage now they're just actually doing some gigs and his friend adrian nash did yes it. anyway yes. it's too much information it was good look out for atlantic junction uh in a venue near you are soon. you are you going to do some more gigs with um ainsley with ainsley yes yeah, so i'm doing one in wimborne in dorset my home county 
When's that? Uh, it's in early September. He's playing at the Wimborne Tivoli Theatre, and I should be playing for about maybe four songs. I want to come down. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a clip I saw of you and Azzy playing, and I thought, man, you've got to do some more gigs with that. So you two sound so flipping good together. It was, um, I mean, A, Ainsley is brilliant. He is amazing. His band is spectacularly yeah, good. So good. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. That's enough from us. Thank you for being here. Thanks again to Thorpe. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for, for being having me. here. And we'll, um, we'll bid you adieu to this Friday. We have no idea what Friday's show is going to be because we haven't filmed it yet. Indeed. It'd be fun. Could be any number of things. Si. Grazie mille. <laughs> Arrivederci. Uh, good. Right. You go away. You go to sleep. Play us out, Dan. Better keep plugging in, man. Arrivederci, you're a daddy. A dream.